Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's Wednesday, and we've got uh, former SEAL Team 6 member, current, current uh, squirrel suit record holder, jumping off of uh, cliffs in Switzerland at all, and uh, Navy SEAL Foundation money raiser, and all around good looking kid. And I say kid because he's a lot younger than I me. I feel safe in here. Yeah, he's got a barrel chest, barrel chest, and uh, keeps his hair short nowadays. Andy Stump. I was calling you Stump. Does he do an intro like that for everybody? Or? Uh, it, yeah. It's, it's, a, little it over, awkward, it's yeah. a little bit over the it's top. It's too much, right? Yeah, yeah, it's too much. It's too much. Uh, are, you, uh, are you jumping a lot lately? Given the weather over the last week, I've actually been pinned to the ground. I actually have three brand new wingsuits that have been staring at me at my house and just low clouds. Who but makes on, are those? Who makes those wingsuits? Is it they're what, actually called squirrel suits? Like most people will see them and they're like, "Oh, it's a squirrel suit." There's actually that's the name. There's actually a brand that. And uh, do you have to squirrel. pay for them, or do they send them to you because you're batshit crazy? <laughs> Well, first because if they said to me, no, crazy. I'm just saying, no, yeah. I'm, no, no. When I say crazy, I mean you're crazy enough. You have the balls enough to jump off a building with squirrels like wings yeah. on. Yeah, it. yeah. Uh, no, you pay for them, but uh, I'm very fortunate to have some sponsors, so it's kind of a pass through cost. And, and, tell and how much would a suit like that cost if I want to jump off? I don't know. Fully logoed bridge. out suit, you're going to run you about twenty six hundred bucks. Wow, cheaper than I thought. Yeah, it's the barrier. high school kids going. Huh? The barriers to entry, you, you, actually, it's a problem. People see stuff on YouTube, and there really is no mechanism to stop you from buying everything that I use to jump off of stuff, and it would show up at your house. And if you could figure out how to put it together and put the stuff on, I mean, there's nobody stopping you. That's, you told me, you scary. told me that in Switzerland, and I don't know if this, I misread what you said, that in two week, in a two week period, baby. misheard in a two week period. Uh, of people were jumping off the cliff you were jumping off of. And in a two-week period, how many people were killed? So my last trip to Switzerland was, I think it was late July, early August of last year. I try to go at least once a year for two, two and a half weeks because there's so much stuff to do. Yeah. But in the Lauterbrunnen Valley, which is like the mecca of base jumping because it's so accessible, each side of the valley, there's trains and cable cars and you can do some hiking stuff. But it's just, it, it's constantly active all day, every day. In a 14-day, two-week time period, 14 fatalities. 14 fatalities? Yep. And Jim, can you bring, how up, many people bring that up? What, what is the, what? It's a tough one to guess. I would say there was probably 150 active jumpers in the valley. But Still a lot of it's, people. It's a lot. But, you know, there also hasn't been an incident report that has surprised me in a couple of years. Like, you see what people are attempting to do. Are you guys always trying to one-up each other? Is that why it doesn't surprise you? Uh I, I wouldn't say that – I mean I don't consider myself inside that community. But the people who are trying to push the leading edge forward and forward and forward, yes, they are in that. So – Got to uh, crack a few eggs and make an omelet. So there's well, a – so probably one of the most famous proximity uh, wingsuit flyers. These are the guys who are flying really close to the ground. His name was Graham uh, Dixon or Graham Dickerson. He died a couple months ago in China attempting something that if you look at the math of what he would have been required to do, glide – percentage glide ratio wise it was not feasible so what was he thinking he was thinking that he needed to continue to push himself to constantly be on the leading edge 15 daredevils die in august alone with one jump posting jumper posting footage of his death facebook live, on live facebook. It. god it was i feel like it's a awesome. bad idea what the fuck, dude? Dude. that video was awesome well the cows the all the cows over there have bells so it, actually i'll probably probably gonna be people mad at me that i said it was awesome but so I'll resend that. I'll say it was really awesome to Is that the video? The video. <laughs> no. Uh, Those are the guys who jumped off the Burj Al Khalifa. That's Fred and Vince. They're amazing. Uh, so shout out to this, Fred and Vince. So this dude. Tandem jumping. So this guy has a wingsuit on, Facebook Live, puts his phone inside of an internal pocket, jumps off, impacts. You hear the last minutes of life. There's usually some gurgling, some breaths. And then it becomes very quiet. And a lot of the animals in Switzerland had these huge cowbells on them. And then That's all you right. can hear I've, is I've been there. to like – Ding, 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 ding. Oh my That's god! How eerie. Now that, I'm assuming they die instantly. No. Well, Sometimes this guy. Well, I mean, his his brain might have been dead, but the body fights it. Oh yeah. yeah. For for a little bit. Uh, there was a couple guys who went in a few years ago. I mean, so in a wingsuit, you're traveling forward. I mean, you can, I can do 120, 130, 140 miles an hour forward with a fall rate. That can maybe I could lower it to I can actually gain altitude now in the new suits for a little bit and then obviously you would fall out of the sky, but you're coming down and maybe you're only falling at 30 miles an hour. So there have been a few people that they basically skip. They find themselves over flatter terrain than they can outfly, 
and they'll skip. And a guy a few years ago, I think, lived about two weeks uh, in the hospital. A buddy of mine went in in France. You guys want to watch an awesome video? A buddy of mine went in in France and lived, was found three hours later by hikers yelling and moaning in his wingsuit. You have the video? Hit it's trees? on YouTube. Hit What's trees? it called? Can you bring that up, Jim? Uh, go to Eric Dos Santos. Just Eric Dos Santos Trees. That's yep. so crazy. Crash. There you go. That'll do it. And and hit. You got to see. You oh, send me these videos, dude, and I and I and I freak out. I can't handle it. So this is uh, this is Chamonix. Amazing exit. You've jumped this. I haven't. I want to. Of course you do. Oh, best feeling in the world, right there. Okay, so he's falling. Now he's flying, and I think they're going to speed up this video here a little bit because it's it's quite a long flight. You make this right hand turn around these rocks. Uh, that's so crazy. <laughs> that's so crazy already. So looks, that in of itself would cool. be a great flight, but this terrain allows um, you to come down here. I know, dude, but pull the chute. Pull the chute, please, now. Doesn't he know? Hey, so, I'm hey, so nervous. Hey, I get so bro. nervous. Sorry, sorry, Is there sorry. any way it could be a less of no, a pussy? No, I, I get so yeah. nervous with this shit. God damn it. You can see he's not. He's lower than the trees, Andy. And he's flying very slow. That's what almost killed him. So, so for me watching this video about 30 seconds ago, I could tell something was wrong. You see he's mistakes? Going, he's going too slow. He's Why stalling. Is he doing the, that? He's, watch this. So he's stalling the suit out. No. no. See, that's an issue. That's an issue. Uh, that's not good. And so it's he, not good. And he lived. He lived. I saw him at the drop zone like a month ago. He's talking about He's all, what's up, man? He was on Facebook the other day like, hey, does anybody have a parachute that I can borrow? And like, no, I don't. I don't have yeah. a parachute that you can borrow. <laughs> that's nuts. He that's... played Russian roulette, had the gun go off, and he lived. Yeah. It shot him in the face? Uh, basically, that's what happened. And he, he survived. He flew his wingsuit into the trees in full flight, and he lived. And, and your, that's him. That's him. Your ability to got some DSLs on him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's an interesting cat. Is he, he's a black guy. Yeah. God damn. Is there a lot of black guys that jump out of the sky? Let me ask you the question. I don't know the stats on that man. I don't know the stats. Well, you're. Around I've seen a couple. The, have you? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say that the majority. Maybe in the ocean, I'd say. Not a lot of black guys jumping or swimming. Is that fair to say, Brennan? Are those stereotypes? I, I, I think so. I believe, yes, yeah, they both would qualify as a stereotype. But Well, you don't see a lot of, like... <laughs> Brennan's just sitting there smiling. You don't see a lot of black guys on the top of Mount Everest. No. Right. Or on K2. No. It's, is that it's a, not yet a black sport. That's just, what? That's they're like, fair. what? Yeah, no. They're like, they're like, I'm not, money off this I'm not climbing all the way up to the fucking mountain for no reason. No, for what? If they did, we'd all be fucked. So I can fall into a mile deep crevasse. Well, they'd get there faster than anyone. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, 14 people, most of them flying wingsuits, had something like that happen, but didn't survive. It's just you, all miscalculations? Like, you can tell right away? You're a stickler some of for it this is, shit, right? Some of it is miscalculation. Some of it is people who are so far above their experience level and just have no respect for the margins or the boundaries or their own experience. And like they try to have done that. Or, yeah, there was a guy who, uh, on his, like, when you put a wing, base jumping in and of itself without a wingsuit on, is high consequence. You have one parachute. You need you, if something goes wrong, you're going to have issues, and you need to have control of your parachute, control of your body. Then you throw on the cross between a prom dress and a straight jacket, right? You get a squirrel suit on, and you jump off, and your mobility is restricted. You have a lot more speed, and you still only have one parachute, and you need to like start off on a jump that's not tex- technically complex. You know, maybe a crawl, walk, run theory yeah. would serve you well if you want to actually extend your lifespan in the sport beyond yeah. you know a few seconds some people skip that they're like nope i'm just gonna throw a wingsuit on this is a moderately technical jump we and they go in uh, i don't surprises that's, nobody that's kind of a, that's kind of a that's kind of stupidity i mean it gets that, a point that's really. humans in general though yeah. i think everyone wants they wants, see it on it youtube now. and they're like yes. i can do it like, like oh that's easy if yeah. i can jump here what's the difference jump here and, and you've had how many hours of jumps where you have as a seal you're jumping out of planes and you're flying. You've learned how to fly from way before you started doing squirrel. Jump. I didn't put a wingsuit on until I had about 3,500 jumps. That's and in those 3,500, 30, think about yeah. how many that is, first of all. Well, and it's the minimum required for uh, – there's a uh, the governing body of skydiving in the U.S. is the USPA, the United States Parachute Association. And they have some guidelines. And their guideline is – and this is ridiculous. No wingsuit jumps until you have 200 jumps. But then beyond that point – it's fair game. And, and you see people who come to the drop zone, and I've seen this happen multiple times. And you hear him talking. I just saw this crazy YouTube video with this guy flying this squirrel suit. How do I get into a wingsuit as fast as humanly possible? Oh, so they man. come there expressing the goal that they just want to get through the 200 jumps, 
to put a wingsuit on. And then they just want to learn how to base jump and go combine the two. And then when they die, it's like, you know, this is my not surprised face. Yeah. Of course you died. And <laughs> this, this is my not surprised face. Yeah. Well, you see them at the yeah. drop zone and they're just and they're like, oh, hey, will you jump with me? And you're like, no, I'm not going to be involved be in any way, shape or form or having a relationship with you because I think what you're doing is stupid. And you're not long for this world. No, and you're going to die. And I'll tell them exactly this. I'm like, your approach is incorrect. You're, you're diving headlong into something you don't understand. You're going to end up dying. And I don't want anything to do with it. So no, go find somebody Andy, else. Is there a lot of like special forces guys like yourself who are doing similar stuff or so, like kind of chasing that kind of adrenaline rush? Do you because because you're obviously an adrenaline junkie? I think that's fair to say. How dare you? I think well, I, I would think not describe. Are. I don't jump for the. I don't get adrenaline like when I skydive at all. It's actually I'm usually asleep on the plane on the way up. Um, base jumping certainly wakes me up and I'm alive and I'm in that moment. But I don't. I don't I'm not seeking the adrenaline aspect of it. I like the challenge of it, but I would say that, you know, that hyper aware hyper acute sensation that most people associate with adrenaline is not the driving cause behind it for me. Then what is it? Cuz couldn't you forget that if it's not adrenaline then couldn't you do ultra marathons or it's not, not the you same be thing. like Cam Haynes or you know what I'm saying? It's not Dude, the same margin for error, stuff. right? It's I mean it, it is, is if you do it right, depending on what you're doing. It is hard to describe. So I love the sensation of flying. But like it feels like it, every picture of me jumping in a wingsuit, I'm smiling because you're flying through the air at 120 miles an hour face first. It's fun. <laughs> it's amazing. And by the way, just over the treetops. Yeah. Well, that's like I, you sent me videos that I that you're so close to the fucking rocks and yeah. trees that I I I keep watching them over and over again because I, I I don't know it freaks me out. It's just stupid. Mm. Yeah. Um. So it feels great, but for me, I mean, honestly, what I get out of it is that that release from all the other BS in my life. And I think I might've talked to you guys a little bit about this. The first time I was on, like when you have your toes on the edge of a cliff and you're in a wingsuit or even just base jumping, you got one parachute on, you are not thinking about, did I, Oh, did I transfer money over to my checking account to cover my mortgage? You're not thinking about an argument you might've had with your spouse. You're not thinking about work. You're in the zone. You are. I mean, I, you literally, most of the time, you know, you spit to check the wind. If you can get enough spit to form in your mouth yeah. to check the wind, your heart is racing. You're scared out of your mind, and you, you know, and you have a choice in that moment: do you let the fear control you, or do you control the fear and continue on with what it is you want to do? But that clarity in that moment, combined with how awesome the flight feels, is why I jump. And then I get. By finding that moment, and it's not it's nothing new or unique to base jumping. There's books written about it. It's the flow state, right? Yeah. And I used to get it in helicopters overseas, like one minute out call from objective you're going to get on. You're really not worried about anything else. Other in other than words, when you're on life, mission and you're about to go. The life in front of your face is the only thing that matters. And for me, I found that, that re, it's like the control alt delete for people who are old enough to remember what that is oh, in, yeah. you know, in a non-Apple uh, world. Mm-hmm. It clears out the hard drive. And it lasts for months after I do one of those months. trips. Yeah. It's wow. awesome. So, so it's more the outlet for me. That's what I get out of it as a person. I truly think it makes me a better father. It makes me it, – it backs off and like it makes me more compassionate. I just have more tolerance because it's, it's that outlet. And I think, Do you think it's a transition? Like do you think it's your, it's your way of getting over – because you and I have had long conversations about you know, combat sure. you know, and, and the kind of stuff that you still deal with in that sense. But like do you think that that is your way – of dealing with sort of the withdrawal from that heightened state of, you know, I guess mental acuity when you're in a combat situation. Cause you, you had to have gotten, they always talk about the hurt locker, the drug of war and shit where you, you, you know, like you said, when you're in a life and death fight, I mean, and you're a competitive guy and the stakes are life and death and you, and you win, like you were pretty eloquent about it. You go, it doesn't suck. Well, no, no, it's not I, like you like killing people. It's just like it doesn't suck. Well, no, you're on a mission, but yeah. also you get a high from it, right? As far as it's, you know, you got a objective. You're there with your boys. You're doing it. And then you get done with that and you're back with civilian life. It you know, feels so it's hard for people to. Being, sa- being successful overseas, like targeting an individual and then successfully being able to prosecute an objective that they're on, capture or kill the person. It feels rewarding because you feel like you, it makes a difference. Yeah, I don't think there's necessarily a high that comes from that. I think it's just a sense of satisfaction. Yep. You would be amazed at the professionalism of the guys that I used to work with. It's not, it's not high fives and chest bumps. Mm. Um, 
There's not even a lot of talking. We're super quiet and we're super slow on target, and it's very methodical and precise and professional. Well, it's almost like, of course, we did this. Yeah, that, you know what I'm that's saying. What like, yeah, that's what we do. That's what we do. It's a singular focus of your life when yeah. you get to that point. Um, Without getting into too many details, with your when you are called on mission, so mm-hmm. you get a, you get coordinates on a phone, probably. Sure. I mean, that's certainly one way you could do it. You okay. could drive them. And then you, you, all of you get the same information probably on some kind of a phone or whatever. So you all convene, right? The, There's and, a full – I mean, so again, and this is why I hate uh, movies. They set these totally unrealistic expectations where everything's constantly blowing up or you know, automatic weapons fire everywhere. It's like where's the 24 to 72-hour planning cycle and multiple briefs on the weather and the objective and the insertion method? Like that's what we spend most of our time doing is planning. Preparation. Then you go out and maybe in a career, 1% of your career would do the stuff that makes it into movies somewhere. Yeah. But that's 99% of the movie. It's just a scale that is completely lopsided and it's on its head. Yeah. It, yeah, it's not as – it can be exciting. Right. But yeah, sitting there and – I mean you're just going through PowerPoint slide and PowerPoint slide and PowerPoint slide. Of, of power- what? Seeing the, the, the objective, like the, the person? The information you have. I mean it starts with the overarching mission statement of how this objective fits into the battle space commander's overall plan for how they're executing war. You, right. can't, you can't just drop in and be like, hey, we, we want to go after this guy. You have to justify it inside of the, inside of the line that the battle space owner has for that area and their objective. If it doesn't fit their objective, they may not let you do it. Yeah. So it's almost like you almost have to get a warrant to do that, right? If, if yeah. it's police work, they have to get a warrant before they – It's a highly structured process behind the scenes that's invisible to anybody else. And like I said, it never shows up in any of the mediums, whether it be the books, the TV shows, or the movies. I'm surprised so- it doesn't show up in the books. It's movies boring. makes a little sense. It's boring. It's boring to read a PowerPoint slide. Yeah. It'd be more boring <laughs> to read about reading, reading other guys slide. reading. But, <laughs> but it's information so you there need. Was. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of details you need. Oh, shit, yeah. yeah. So there detail. we were at O oh, Dark 30 reading about the weather. I'll take it. Though. I mean, we have slides on when the sun is going to come up, when the moon's going to come you up, the amount of that. illumination, the yeah. weather. What a coordinated effort, man. It, and that's yeah, a, and there's yeah. another thing, too. Like, if you look at, if you only focus on, say you were able to find a person, that's one spoke on a wheel. You had the intelligence community that was helping you and bringing you information. You had the aviation assets, the mechanics. I mean, there's the people who service the radios. I mean, it's like the, it's just, it, the movies are such a thin wedge into the world that I mean it's and it's not their fault. Well, it's we're just, all yeah, yeah. The movies are for guys like us who like to hear. You have no young idea. Men. Yeah. Well, well, that's anything. You want to see the life. You watch and death a fighting movie, and I'm like, oh, I roll my eyes. I'm like, yeah. oh my god, this. Yeah. Is have so you ever long. seen a fighting movie that got anything right? Never. 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 Have you ever seen a war movie that got it right? I've seen movies that get aspects of it right. Like yeah, one, of the, aspects, one of the yeah. best opening sequences to a movie ever is Saving Private Ryan. The oh, first yeah. fifteen minutes oh, of that yeah. movie the D-Day? Oh, yeah. are money. They capture the, the you can't hear and all that the stuff. the chaos. The it just but it just captures the confusion. And then uh, Black Hawk Down, essence of that, same kind of the same yep. thing. It captures more of the chaos. Mm-hmm. Do you see one, the, one of the, you see the noticed, thirteenth hour uh, with the no. Benghazi thing? Do, do, do you see Zero Dark Thirty? Yes, that that's pretty realistic, isn't it? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Uh, yeah, but but like one of the things that I, I maybe I told you this I was doing a sketch for Mad TV and a stuntman came in and shot Uzis in a room with full loads and they had to full loads like of that. blanks yes yeah and dude let me tell you something it's so fucking loud of course uh, not only was it loud but there was smoke everywhere I couldn't see anything yeah. it's yeah. something I never thought about so when they come into the room and they go like that. It was like it was like you go like this. What the fuck, Jesus Hell Christ! Yeah. Like, hurts your ears. And then your ears are ringing, and you can't see anything. The whole room is full you, of smoke. Do you know uh, Tim Kenny at all? I think we've talked about. this. I have met him. You know all of them. Uh, yeah, you know, I've met him a couple times. Okay. Yeah. He uh, he's interesting because he's back in right. Yep. He's, he's he just back. reenlisted. Yeah, which is crazy because we we're going to Austin, and I went, "Hey man, gonna be out there. Let's get you on the show." And uh, I don't hear anything. Don't hear anything. I should get a picture. Boom! And it's him. It's just a, it's just his sleeve. You know, it says whatever special yeah. force ranger Kennedy. He goes, sorry, can't. I was like, good God. He's Fuck clocked him. in, man. He's, he's working. He, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, he's jobbing. Uh, you don't himself. have to text me, man. If you're yeah. on, you yeah. know, like you, you, there's no need yeah. for that. You and I were talking, and it's a, it's 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 sensitive because we were talking about we're really using a lot of special forces guys, and over the past mm-hmm. 13 years, we've killed a lot of people. And we've killed a lot of people with teams and, you know, with drones. Yeah. And, you know, you really wonder, after all of this, all due respect, and we, you and I have talked, is 
how, how effective has it been in the overall objective of bringing peace to that region or at least bringing a government into that region that we can work with um, and the overall stability of the, of the Middle East? And that's got to be on your mind sometimes or maybe you don't think about it. You know, and it's I wonder your, if a guy's it's not your guy's job, is it? It becomes it later. You spent, right? I mean, you have the rest of your life to th- sit back and think about. Wh- I mean, I, I I think about it. I don't know more or less than other people, but I I spend a lot of time thinking about it because I look at my two sons, uh, one who's getting ready to go into eighth grade, and the other one's just a year behind him. And you know, what's it going to say in the textbooks that mm. they learn from? What are they going to get taught about? The places that I went, and it, and it, for me at least, I spent a lot of time looking in the rearview mirror, which obviously you have a lot better vision looking back, and trying to figure out whether or not anything that I've ever done in my career actually had any impact whatsoever. Uh, wow. And for me, the answer that I come back to, if I'm being totally honest, is probably not. That's amazing, man. I I, th- I think the question is: Did- is what kind of impact were you looking for? Like, do you think, yeah, you know? I think the problem itself is more complex than the solution that we're throwing at it. I think that the problem that we're facing today is never going to be solved by bombs and bullets. And that's coming from a SEAL Team 6 guy. However, though, we still have to do the things that we're doing. And the, the easiest analogy that I can make for people is if you're standing at a dam and there's some water spurting out, you're probably better off plugging the holes that you can to prevent yourself from drowning over time as opposed to it letting it get to a point where it's going to catastrophically break. So that is the role that I see the kinetic activity overseas for the United States of America is to plug as many holes as they can. And that does have an impact, but it's not going to have an impact on a huge geopolitical level. And that's that's the most important thing because bringing up that and being honest with that is something that has to be in the public dialogue and it has nothing to do with whether being unpatriotic or supporting the troops. I fucking hate when people talk that way. What it has to do with is if we can learn from our past, are we going to learn from our history, our recent history in this case, our current history that we're living right now? And how do we avoid this in the future or is there a better tact? And I, I don't know the answer. Does, does, your, you know? does the rest of your team agree with that stance, Andy? Have you guys talked about it? I don't know. I mean, I, I have really no authority to speak for anybody other than myself. I think some of the guys that I worked with are very dedicated and would probably never say that they don't think that what they did. I think that I had impact in plugging the holes. I don't think I saved, saved the dam from collapsing at some point. That's, I guess, would be a better articulation. Did anyone save the dam, though? So, yes, yeah, somebody can save the dam, but the problem is I don't think it's the Western world. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's got to be them. It has to be them. Yeah. So if 1% of Islam is considered radical, and I'm, and I'm making that number up. I have no idea what the percentage is. But let's, yeah. say, let's say it's just 1% for easy yeah. math. The Western world is never going to be able to influence that 1%. The only way that problem is going to solve is if the other 99% of the people get in and they do something about it. Until then, we are in a position as a nation to provide space for who we want to be that we have to continue to strike when we see a hole come into the I wall. couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more with that. And I think that you just said create space. And I think that's where you guys come in handy. You know, That I, was I, our I, job. Yeah. If, you, if you were to ask me at the end of the day or today what I thought my purpose was in the military, it was to create space for this country so that we can exercise the freedoms that we have. Because yeah. you cannot exercise any freedom when you have pressure on top of you. So we all know we all, all know that there are people out there that want to blow us to smithereens. Yes. That's a fact. And there are, there are motivated people who are organized to do that. And that's when and when shit happens, you know, what we all do is we go and guys like Andy and Tim Kennedy and those guys are on it, you know, thank God. Thank God because if if we don't have the sheepdogs keeping the wolves at bay. And it's just but, but, but you're always going to have the wolves. If you read bay. history, it's always been when, always. A, when a country can do something to another country, they yeah. do it. I mean, it's just it's just what happens. Human beings are like that towards each other. There's 100%. X and Y people, and they're always going to fight. I mean, 100%. that's just the reality of it. Never it's been a, I mean, it's a super complex problem. I mean, yep. it, and that's why a simple solution, which is, you know, kinetic actions in my mind are relatively simple. They don't have anywhere the nuance or complexity of diplomacy mm-hmm. uh, and the type of nation interaction with nation that would be required, it, like – there's a place for it, but again, it's a spoke on the wheel. There's got to be more than just that. Do you know anything about this? So Trump is said to have released highly classified information to the Russian ambassador. Yeah. Do you know anything about like uh, if that? Do you have any idea of what that is, or if that's like 
how how as a for for a guy who was in a position to rely on intelligence and re- intelligence methodology and all that is that potentially really um something that could get guys on the ground our guys killed or put in bad situations it, it, he put a spy in jeopardy but not one of the american spies there's another one right <laughs> I mean, uh, and because like this conversation, I find myself paying attention to absolutely nothing that happens at that level. (laughs) Because like, where did you hear that he put a spy in jeopardy from? Where did you hear that the Washington Post? That's what I'm saying. So like, I have first off, it would depend on the degree of information. I mean, were they in there playing strip poker and then the pot was the nuclear launch codes? I mean, I don't know. We don't know. We don't don't fucking know. It's all bullshit. That's what I'm saying. Like all bullshit. Because I have absolutely no idea. And six sources are going to give you six different versions Mm -hmm. of information. It's like, what? I don't know. So basically you're saying don't ask the stupid fucking questions. (laughs) You weren't in there. You know, at the end of the day, though, I don't know. You know, I don't look at the president as being the most powerful person. I mean, I respect I respect the office. The person who sits in the chair still has to earn my respect. But mm-hmm. that person is only as effective as the people that are around him and the team that he puts Correct. together. Yep. And there's no way that he could have insight into everything the military is doing and the intelligence organization and work on the economic stuff. So if it's anything like the military, when you go and you brief your boss on something that's getting – like you know, you look at his calendar and, hey, he's got to do a brief to the admiral on this day. Well, in the days leading up to that, you brief him up on the talking points that he's going to get. Yeah. He doesn't really operate on a day-to-day level with an innate knowledge of what's going down uh, the boots on the ground level. So, I mean, I and I don't know much about the president, the, uh, the office of the president. I would assume it's the same way, though, because the, the bureaucratic organization is multiple as the size yeah, of the there's military. There's a structure. I think if he's going to leak something, you know, I, I, yeah. I don't think you just leak it and no one knows what he's right. doing. Right. Also, also, whoops. Yeah. Also, his Oh, national... did I just send that? What did you send? <laughs> what did you send? <laughs> yeah. I don't think it works yeah, like that. Yeah, his national security advisor was yeah. there. I love like, how people no, are so stupid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, he Oh, but, whoops. Sorry. You know how many chains of command and they track everything he does? Yeah. Unless he, unless, but he is briefed. So unless he was briefed. So if he has a short attention span, which they say he does, so he just wants the bullet points. Problem is sometimes when you get the bullet points and you kind of spill the beans they're like bro there was so much behind the fact that we know that that you can't and all of a sudden the russians go well how do they know that there's a threat to airlines with laptops and all that shit and they can put i mean the cliff notes would be important as well and I'm assuming he gets a briefing every day, and it's probably not best to share that with somebody who's from a different nation. Yeah, but again, our I, friends. Who Russian. knows though? I mean, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, you know. if he did <clears throat> spill the beans on that, like that's that's a problem, and it should be and it should be addressed. But I think nobody in this room is ever going to get the brass tacks on whether or not that actually happened. That's, How, a, that's a problem do, today. Do your kids know. ask you a lot of questions, Andy, about what you did? Sporadically, yeah. uh, sometimes around like when they'll watch movies, or my son, surprisingly enough, is a fan of first person shooter video games. Yeah. What a surprise! And he wants to know why I won't play with him because it's like, listen, <laughs> your tactics suck, but you're beating me, so I refuse to reinforce this <laughs> shitty paradigm. I was gonna bring Andy, we we're gonna do so- shitty paradigm we gonna <laughs> with Fabrizio, yeah. And uh, I was like, I was like, Andy, I want you, I'm like, come, will you come play airsoft with me? He goes, just tell me when, cunt. <laughs> he goes, uh, I was like, did so he beat me? He goes, I'm going to fuck It's more than likely that's the exact response that I gave. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, like my son like likes to run in the middle of the room and do circles and jump up and down. And, and I'm like, you know, peeking around the corner and he shoots me every time. So I refuse to play in a structure like that. It doesn't reward good tactics and that's reinforces hilarious. dog shit. Would, <laughs> he, he will, you, will you be opposed if they want to fall in your footsteps? It would be probably one of my biggest fears. Um just as I'm sure it was the biggest fear of my parents. My mom came from an uh, army brat side of the house. Both her mom and dad served in the army. My dad was a machine gunner on the first squadron of patrol boats in Vietnam. Had no desire, I'm assuming, for me to follow in the career path that I did. And I come home one day when I'm 17. And they knew I wanted to be a SEAL, like from 11 years old. Yeah. I come home one day. I was like, hey, uh, yeah, I just went to the Navy recruiter's office. And can you guys sign here? Because I'm a minor, but I'm going to enlist in the Navy and... So I'm going to need some signatures. And, like, oh, and they signed shit. it. So, yeah. And it allowed me to become the person that I wanted to be. And I have no right to prohibit my kids from doing the same thing. Well, but you're doing um, – I wouldn't say – you know, the, obviously the Navy SEAL stuff is insane as far as how tough it is and just 
that whole journey's insane. It's not that big of a deal. Well, we'll relax back that on off that. Relax on that. We're relax, relax on that. On that. Hey, hey. You're a little jaded by <laughs> hey, it. Hey, Andy. Hey, yeah. Andy. Yeah, it is. But we'll back off. It's not one, that hard. Knowing what's going on here, so you're Navy SEAL, and then you're jumping, you're in the f- squirrel suit. One <laughs> son's like, I want to be a Navy su- SEAL. The younger one's like, yeah, I want to be the squirrel guy. <laughs> it's a disaster. You're, yeah. like, what? you're just like, what the fuck? But you caused this kind it's of... Like, it's like Tiger watching a uh, freaking fight. Fights, yeah. You know, the reality is, is that I don't think... Neither my kids or my wife give two shits about what I do. They're into their bullshit. Own, they're into their your own wife, stuff. Your wife has, says nothing. We're like, hey, babe, I'm headed to Antigua. I'm going to jump off this fucking. I mean, she asked if the life insurance policy's paid up. But... <laughs> your, wife, your wife and I've met her. Your wife because they came to my show in, in San Diego. Your wife. You've been married how long? Uh, sixteen years. She was with you through the whole fucking yeah. thing. Where you'd be gone for three hundred days, never knowing if there was a knock at the door. Yep. She's got to be a piece of work. She's got to be a solid. Or dead behind the eyes. Or dead behind the eyes. She's either awesome or she's just (laughs) dead behind the eyes. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, there's a chance she might listen to this, so I'm not going to answer (laughs) it. No, I mean, it's. uh, She's a dime piece, too, by the way. I mean, she's she's been. Good looking women. She's been been through a ton, and I think she just inherently trusts me to make good decisions. I mean, I think I'd be. I'm alive today because I have a history of making the best decision that I can and being responsible so i mean she's into her own stuff i mean and yeah. i'm just i kind of do my stuff in the morning you know i wake up every morning i make the kids lunch they go off to school she heads off and does her horse thing i head up to the drop zone get as many jumps in as i can we figure out who's going to pick up the kids and wow i mean it's just what what was the so the full you're a full-time jumper is that the yeah spend He's about a dad half jumper. my year dad slash jumper yeah about dad, half slash my dad year. jumper like uh, uh, tomorrow, jump. I'll go jumping. I'll probably knock out somewhere between eight to ten jumps in one of those new wing suits. Why, just, why are you doing that? You, it's because it's all about feel. You know, Practice. you're driving a car. You got a speedometer, a tachometer. You got lane lines, and it's all you got all that information. I, I know suits Andy, but, are but all I, feel. I take tennis lessons. Okay, I work on my tennis. Congratulations uh, yeah. on that. Now, now you're jumping the fuck God, out. Of could planes. you guys be any more? Well, obviously, more that's what I'm saying. <laughs> what I'm saying, dude. I'm like, I, I, hey, bro, I box too. But here's Not the thing. Really. <laughs> hold on, hold no, on I'm second. like I'm looking at this. Sir, I'm gonna ask you, sir. I'm gonna ask you. I hit, try, I take tennis sir, lessons, I until and I we're talking about, fade, this. and I might spar today with a fa- full face gear. Yeah. Here's the thing, and we're, we're not gonna hit too hard. Now, here's the thing, and and we and we bump gloves. Now, here's the thing, Andy. Um, uh, I understand that you're doing a lots of jumping, and you're doing that. Is the goal uh to get a world record, which I think you already have? I'm done with that. I wouldn't do that jump again if you paid me. But you have that world dollars. record. Uh, I never actually filed for the world record. Okay. I, I broke the record, and it, that whole thing was just, again, around the fundraising stuff. That Is that the one we saw time. where you're yeah. on top of that thing and just... On top of the... It was out of an airplane. God, what, what am I thinking? Oh, no, that was a... Uh, Do you have that on video? Somewhere. I want it's to not see that, that exciting. You sent me a video of... Yeah, I remember that. Well, yeah, it's like... Yeah. So, when, but now when you're jumping every day, is it obviously to get a feel for the suit? But are you, is it some big like it's to currency? Get ready? It, like it's like training, but is, are you doing it because you have a big jump coming up? Or it's just it's for longevity, for survival. The suits, like I said, it's all so when you skydiving is less consequence free. So you can do a lot of stuff. You can do some acrobatic stuff. You can you can get bent out of shape in your suit and learn how to recover from it. You can get steep, you can fly flat and you don't want to mess with any of those things in a base jumping environment. Cause you're much closer to the ground. So, and again, there's no, there's no gauges. It's all, it's all tactile. It's all what you can feel. see and how you feel. Like you feel the suit inflated because of the speed. If it feels rigid, if it feels uh, a little bit looser, like it gives you a feedback of what you can do with the suit. So, I mean, I'm the same, I would assume like when you were doing, fighting if you take a month off you get back in you're like god it, i mean like i'm doing the right things but it just doesn't, timings off yeah, yeah it doesn't feel right yeah. and usually i do my base jumping trips in either july or august so i want to be as current in my suits as possible before i get over that makes there. sense yeah. because you're addicted to jumping let's be honest i mean you know, i've had some of the best experiences of my life jumping and i think i've had probably the most terrifying experience of my life jumping so i've had the polar opposite you don't plan to stop anytime soon is the point i'm making how old are you andy no 39 Thirty nine. So you're not old. Can, is there a lot of fifty year olds jumping? Fifty year olds, sixty year olds, seven year olds. Hold up, seventy year olds in a squirrel suit. Look up how how old in a squirrel suit. I don't know. Squirrel suit. I'm. Well, go ahead and find the old look. Look how suit. look how old Bush like was the last time he did a tandem. He was in his nineties. Whoa, tandem though, bro. Squirrel suit at seventy. I feel like it's a bad idea. Now, if we you and I do a tandem jump, mm-hmm. explain what that means. And could it look any gayer? And yeah, you, I can make. You, we are we can gay naked? It up. First I'll of all, it up. yeah. <laughs> you you will have the choice. I will be clothed. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I mean, um, a tandem jump is easy. It's actually the best exposure to people. 
jumping. And, you know, when I said a second ago, the worst experience of my jumping career, probably one of the scariest ones of my life was on a tandem. Why? So, well, maybe we should do the tandem before I tell no, you the story. I need, I need to hear because I'm already afraid. <laughs> but I'll, I'll give you an example of what, so tandem is easy. I mean, it takes like 10 minutes to fill out the waiver. I took Cam for a tandem. It was awesome. He came down for Cam, the day. Cam, Cam Haynes. Yeah, yep. he's phenomenal. That dude gets me up early in the morning. He works harder Badass. than, yeah, he just, the dude just grinds it out, right? I told him for sure, quit your regular job. Focus on all the shit you're doing. What's he do for a regular job? He works for the water. Water authority. I don't know. Uh, like, whatever. He, he should just yeah. keep doing what he's doing because yeah. he's making the world a better place. Um, but, you know, he shows up. He fills out a waiver. Sometimes the waiver takes longer than the actual jump itself. Mm-hmm. Throw you in a harness. You're in a harness. I'm in a parachute. I brief you on what's going to happen. But really, all I need you to do is smile and relax because if you can smile, you're probably relaxed. The wind does it for you. You know, it's a gas and you can feel it pushing against you, the resistance, as soon as you jump out of the plane. I have all the responsibility, and you just get it. It's a good exposure to skydiving, and mm-hmm. most people do their first jump. Uh, attached to another Attached person. to another person. So for you and I, you know, definitely we'll go clothing optional. Yeah, for you, obviously. I'll be clothed. Is and there a weight limit in? I'll have a Velcro. There is, you and I are both big guys, so I don't I You like would have to go with idea. a smaller tandem master because there's yeah. this maximum suspended weight. You wouldn't want the harness to fail, even though I'd be willing to give it a go for you because I like – You can go ahead and pass like, that. You're too big, man. You're too big. Um, uh, yeah. It ain't it's for me. It ain't for me. I like But if life. you sweet talk me, like we'll life. go facing instead of facing – Are there any Navy SEALs as big as he is? Oh, yeah. Really? There's some dudes who are like 280. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Seriously? Yeah. So you ready for a good tandem story? Because yeah. this, this is the worst probably experience of my life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you do it with them, bro. That's yeah, so what I'm say. saying. So I'll give you the choice. I'll take you for a tandem first or I'll tell you the no, story. I want to hear the Let's story. Let's hear the story. Then it'll be more, more scary. So if I look back at my career, I actually am probably more proud of some of the jump stuff that we did because we, we figured out a complex solution to a difficult problem. You're talking about SEAL team stuff? SEAL or? team stuff. Okay. We did a lot of uh, testing and evaluation. And – there's places in the world that are really hard to get to. And a lot of the times we use assets that are really loud. And guess what? People hear those assets. They know what that generally means if they're on their A game and they bail. So maybe it'd be a good idea to be able to get people to remote areas. So we went all over the U.S., up into Colorado. We did jumps into the Leadville Airport, like in an elevation above 10,000 feet. And it, it's difficult. We did tree stuff. We did mountainous exits. We did nighttime stuff. We jumped equipment we jumped bundles we played around with all sorts of different canopies just to figure out these complex solutions of getting people places that are hard to go yeah and i have always liked jumping so i i was kind of specialized in doing the tandems for those operations uh, surprisingly enough i don't i speak english at a, like a probably a high school level you get me into a foreign country i can't speak the language nor can most guys so we have to bring with us interpreters oh yeah who don't know how to jump out of airplanes yeah so there we were <laughs> It's so interesting because you, now you're talking about an airplane with a mouthpiece. You, you, basically a Google translator. Oh, it gets human. better. So, so there we were in a, in a galaxy far, far away <clears throat> back in like 2004. And a complex, complex problem presented itself. And we needed to take somebody who spoke the, the native tongue. Sure. And at the time, I needed to go pack the parachute. So I actually didn't see the passenger until we got onto the C-130 aircraft at night. Now, mind you, this was going to be... We were on oxygen for this jump, so we were at least 15,000 feet above ground level. I think the drop zone was at five to 7,000 feet, so we were in the mid-20s. How cold is it, it up there? Oh, we're getting there because that's part oh, of the story. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so it's nighttime. The brief goes down. I go and I pack the parachute. Another one of the tandem masters puts the interpreter into a tandem harness. Uh, now, the civilian tandem harness that I'll put you in doesn't have some of the attachment points because my rucksack with all of my stuff then went on the front of him. I had my weapon on me, and he had two oxygen bottles on him with one hose going to me, one hose going to him. It was a complete shit show. Shit show. I mean, it's really, if you were to look up shit show, there might be a yeah, picture of like that. It a complete shit show. <laughs> Just a scared little translator yeah. like this. Already a disaster. All right. Full of gear. So it's nighttime, right? The What's amb- he getting paid an hour? <laughs> I don't know. He quit two days after this happened, so I don't think he got his paycheck. He didn't make it to the 15th. So... We go out there, and the ambient lighting on a C-130 to preserve your night vision before we flip down our goggles is red lights because it helps preserve your night vision. We get onto the airplane. I meet this dude. He is wearing man jammies, which is basically very thin. It looks like a dress for a dude, and uh, sandals. Now, I am wearing every piece of cold weather clothing that I owned because it was the wintertime. And I looked at him, and I was like – Good for you, sir. I appreciate your effort. <laughs> yeah. 
come to find out, he had never been in an airplane. So not only was he about to do his first flight, he was about to do his first jump Dude. at night at an altitude in the mid 20s in a galaxy far, far away. In some sandals. This poor man. In some sandals. So now me, I have every layer of cold weather gear on possible, gloves. And so the flight takes off. There was a, a little bit of a flight time. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Did anybody, anybody say, bro, you need a jacket. You need some pants. Shooter's choice. You know, you, you bring to the table what you want to play with. Mm-hmm. You know? Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> All right. Uh, he he might have had some warmies on underneath. Okay. I was just... I was like, all right, cool. It's, sure. a, it's aggressive, but I respect it. Zone, yeah. I did yeah. that stupid record jump with a long sleeve t-shirt on. I'm not the smartest person either, right? It was negative 50 at exit altitude for that jump. So it's, oh, I'd like to say I'm a sharp tool in the shed. I'm not a rake. You know what right. I mean? I'm yeah. more along the lines of like an ax or a shear or something yeah, like right. that, but I don't always make the best decisions yeah. either. So the plane takes off and about 30 minutes, you know, there's a lot of time in flight. So I, I go to sleep. Airplanes put me to sleep. He didn't go to sleep. He, for whatever reason, I can't figure out why, I was a little bit more emotionally <laughs> oh, evolved oh, with oh, the situation. I wonder, yeah, yeah, I wonder, yeah. So he starts throwing up about mm-hmm. 10 minutes before we have to jock up because there, it's a whole – it's very structured. Military free fall is very structured. It's based on 20-minute warnings, 10-minute warnings, and it's six minutes before you exit the aircraft for a military tandem. You hook up to your passenger. So he has his little frap hat on, and he was getting sick, thrown up into a bag. So we we're going to put him on pure oxygen early so he could – you know, it helps you feel better a little bit. So we put him on pure oxygen, seemed to calm down a little bit. At six minutes, I stand up. We had a great support crew. Because of all that shit show that was attached to him and then the stuff that was attached to me, I basically just stood there and everybody else hooked me up. And there was another jump master just to make sure that everything was going to go okay. Because the tandem stuff can be complex with all those extra components. And then the ramp comes down. So to add a layer to this story, we were – not a very far distance from another sovereign nation. And we'll leave it at that. So we get ready to jump. And the way the ramp comes down, and there was this weird suspended dust in the air. It looked like pea soup through my night vision goggles. I don't know what it looked like through the Terp's eyes because he, he didn't have a pair of night vision goggles. <laughs> they wouldn't, no, no well, he, goggles? No, I mean, he, he had his eyes. Figured so he had out. the ability to see, just yeah. not at the night. The plane yeah. has been warm up till now, right? And now... Yes, the temperature... It goes down as the ramp comes down. Yeah. yeah. And so we're looking out, and there's two lines of people getting ready to jump. And the way it works is one line goes out followed by the other line. It's better than having one really long line because as each person goes, the gap in between kind of it, – it, it increases. And on a C-130, every second that you are delayed from another jumper is 100 yards because they're going so Jesus. fast. So That's... if you're one – yeah. So we had – let's say we had 10 jumpers. Let's say there was one second separation between them. That's a kilometer between the first jumper and the last jumper. So to shorten that, you can go side by side. There's a variety of ways, but the goal is to get out as fast as possible. So you're as close to each other as you can be because we navigate together under canopy, talking on our radios. Oh, in my oxygen mask is my radio. I have the ability on my chest. I have a navigation board with a compass and altimeter and a GPS. So much fucking gear. Oh, this was game on. Like we were going to fully navigate under canopy. We probably would have been under canopy for maybe 20, 30 minutes. Just what does that under canopy mean? That parachutes open over your head. We had high glide parachutes. So we were traveling a substantial distance, totally blacked out, no markings, either overt or covert. We had no IR stuff because we were aware that other people have the ability to have, see that IR signature stuff. What is IR? Infrared. So there's chem lights How you cool can. Is this shit? Yeah, there's chem lights you can crack that glow not to the naked eye, but through night vision goggles, it looks like a beacon. Or we have oh, wow. strobe covers that are IR strobe covers. And you flip it on, and you can see the flash. But anybody who has the IR ability to see that, or even old like Sony cameras have a night vision setting, you can look up there and you can see that stuff as well. So we're fully blacked out. I had my own little navigation kit, and the plan was is that I was the last guy in the first row, because I had to basically waddle. And this dude, by the way two inches taller than me, which is unheard of for uh, a person of a that, dude from in, that galaxy. From that, you almost said it. Because <laughs> <You almost said, laughs> of bad nutrition or yeah, whatever. Almost yeah. unheard of from a dude from that galaxy. So the goal is, so this first row starts going. I'm going to be the last jumper to go, but hopefully I have waddled to the edge by the time the rest of these people go. So as the last guy goes, I go immediately as well. And because you're jumping with another human being who has a vote, unfortunately, when you do a tandem If you look at a video of somebody doing a free fall in a tandem, there's a drogue parachute that's suspended behind them. It slows down two bodies to the speed of one because there's only – you have the double weight but only one surface area cutting through the wind. So that drogue parachute 
has to be out for your main parachute to come off your back. And that comes like, out right that's away? It's like the little smaller it's one. It's a little small and it's yeah. slowing you down. So okay. in the military setting, these guys, uh, the guys I was with were jumping out and they were pulling their parachute four seconds later because we wanted to fly under canopy, not fall down. Okay. So the faster you can get your parachute off your back, the better. Well, I need to have that drogue parachute out before I can pull my main parachute. So I had a guy standing on the ramp of the aircraft who was holding on to that drogue parachute, which probably saved my life. Because at about the point in this story, this is where it transitions to one of the worst experiences of my life. So the first jumper goes into the pea soup. And By the way, this guy's in front of you. He is and hooked all up the gear. to me in front of me. All the gear that yes. we, it looks like I'm jumping a uh, small yeah. rhinoceros in front of me. Yeah. I mean, and he's taller than me yes. and he's just kind of holding on to the ruck and he sees people start to jump. And at that point <sighs> decided that he was no longer interested in this skydiving evolution. <laughs> Not your choice this far, my man. So he puts his feet out in front of us and starts clawing like a cat that's wet to try to get a hold of the side of the aircraft. So my only choice is to bear hug him at this point and start hip checking him to get towards the ramp. Oh, you going. So now mind you though, that my, my row is already gone. Now the other row, they're gone too. Shit's and really I'm on the airplane by myself. Seven seconds, eight oh, seconds, oh nine God. seconds. I finally get up to the edge of the aircraft holding onto this dude. And we basically go out feet first, standing up. His feet hit the wind first and we immediately start spinning like a top. Which thankfully, that my buddy, who ended up jumping out after us, he also got completely hosed in this evolution. He held onto my drogue until it came to extension, and I'd have enough experience that I felt it tug on the gear. I just felt the sensation that the drogue was out, and I immediately pulled our parachute, even though we were spinning like a complete top. Oh my! So the parachute God. comes out, and the lines are just twisted three quarters of the way up. Now, mind you, I can see all of this. My man. He's just levitating in space, I think. For he, all thinks he, he thinks he's Game just Oldest. now. This is the worst night of his life. <laughs> he's just now in it. He's now levitating, right? He's just now in the pitch black. He can probably hear the C-130 flying away. Freezing. Whatever. <clears throat> so the, the parachute's opening. And as we went out, because his feet went out first, my body kind of sunk down underneath him. The drogue pulled and then pulled us to a belly-to-the-earth orientation, which shifted him the direction it should have been, but it grabbed that board that had all of my navigational tools and pinned it in between us. You can't see you. Yeah, we'll get to that. It's good. Fuck. So the parachute opens. I get all the twists out. And I'll, in the meantime, while all this is happening, so I'm in the airplane probably by myself for, I'll say, between 10 to 15 seconds. So we're talking at least a kilometer to a kilometer and a half from the last jumper that got out before me. So you're so far away. But now I can hear them talking because there's a series of procedures. You know, you make sure that everybody's there. The lead jumper starts navigating. They're waiting for me to check in. And I would like to think that I'm pretty good at keeping my shit together. (laughs) And I always prided myself on sounding calm on the radio. I don't know how calm I was sounding in these particular moments because they're waiting for me to check in. And I'm probably like, uh, I got some shit going on. And like my, I was in an elevated state at this yeah. point. All right. I, was, yeah. I wasn't the pot wasn't boiling, but there were some fucking bubbles on the yeah. bottom of the pan. Yeah. yeah. So I get the canopy open and I can't see anybody. I can hear him checking in on the radio. I can hear him calling the bearing that they're going to be flying. So they were trying to give me references to help me out. So now the canopy's open. I'm looking down at a mountain range and somewhere in this mountain range is a border to a country. And I don't know if I'm flying towards it or away from it. All it looks like is a mountain range. And so, you know, pre GPS, uh, I used to do, I was a point man. So I'd walk up front and I would do compass navigation, but a lot of the times you just pick a star. And if you can find the North star, right, you can orient orient yourself and you can navigate. Well, surprisingly enough, when you look at the stars through night vision goggles, they're all pretty goddamn bright. Yeah, they all look. So cool. I'm looking for the North Star, and I'm just like, oh, all God. Look like the North. <laughs> yeah. So they're all just beacons, and of course, there's millions of them. So like, that's out. Yeah. So I just pick a direction, and I and I and I'm trying to get in between me and the tandem passenger. And at this point, I can feel him in front, and he's kind of convulsing a little bit, crying. I don't know what was going on. And then it seemed like we were flying through, uh, like basically like a cloud. So I started getting moisture all over me. And, and I'm reaching in and I'm reaching in and I finally get the compass board out that has the compass, which is largely irrelevant at this point, the altimeter, which just gives me that visual reference. And then my GPS, which, which I really wanted because I had Incredible. all of the points locked into place and I could just hit, you know, go to and navigate to one. 
thankfully, and for my benefit, it had factory reset. So it was showing me uh, as being directly over the top of Hong Kong. So that was really helpful in that situation. <laughs> so, <laughs> Holy Jesus fuck. Christ. And how much time has gone by so far? A couple <clears throat> minutes. And so, you know, and again, I just keep getting wetter and wetter, and I'm trying to manipulate the GPS, but my gloves are now completely soaked. Uh, and at this point, our canopy goes into a radical dive. Uh, and I look to see what it is, and the tandem passenger has climbed up, and he's grabbed one of the control <sighs> toggles. And he's hand over handing up the control toggle, initiating this crazy spin down towards. Because he's just panicking. He's panicking. Well, he can't see anything. To me, it's a daylight. To him, it's just a nightmare that he's living. It almost been better to choke him to sleep and just jump. Yeah, no, we're getting to that. Point. So oh, my, my, only, uh, my only emergency procedure that I could think of to remedy the problem was to elbow him at the back of his head as hard knock as I him could. Out. Yeah. I was trying to separate his spine, actually, if I'm being honest. I was trying to knock his head off of his spinal column. Because you were both going to die. We were both going to die. So he goes limp eventually, uh, and I just go back to work. So. <laughs> this poor guy. <laughs> just trying to help you. Hey, dude, get the fuck! Yeah. Ah, you're going to be super wet. You don't understand, though. Gonna... Once the spins start coming <clears throat> and they start increasing, it's like the centrifugal force. Some bad things can happen. They can accelerate on themselves. Mm. It can get uncontrollable. So I was just literally trying to solve the problem. Yeah. So now I'm totally wet. I'm trying to get my GPS on. I can't. And so I have already taken my oxygen mask off. I hate those things. And we had been at altitude enough that I, I felt fine. I left the oxygen mask on him. So I can't push the buttons on my GPS. So I needed to take my glove off. And the only option I had to do was to bite it off. And as I brought up my glove to my mouth to bite it off, I realized that it wasn't moisture from the air. It was vomit from the passenger in front of me that I was covered in. Because oh he was God. filling up his oxygen mask with vomit to the anti-suffocation valve, which was then spitting all over me. <laughs> ah, that's so awesome. I had to bite off every finger of my glove through his with vomit. The, oh, God. That feels great. I I'm sure it, it's great. So I spit it into the app and just like, just uh, spit it off. Keep working with my GPS. The whole time I'm trying to check in on the radio, try to find the rest of the guys, trying to pick a point to land. And at some point, it's like, I don't know where I am. I now have to pick a landing zone and I'm on my own. Yeah. Like with dead weight, with, with no idea. Weight. Well, no, he, he wakes up again. It gets better again. So <laughs> as I'm messing with the GPS again and I'm looking over my shoulder, we start to dive in the other direction because he repeated his emergency move of trying to climb hand he over hand. He popped up like a zombie? He came back like at a it, dude. shit translating zombie? So he came... Ah! So, vomit, vomit everywhere. Yeah, no, I'm covered. I, so in, he, Any idea what he was eating? Would he give it away? I, later, yes, because I saw his oxygen mask. There was carrots in there. There was some eggs in there. It was awesome. That's awesome. I was trying carrots to figure out what ethnicity up. was based off the food. But he was eating American food because he was with us on the base. Yeah, That's carrots true. and eggs are great. Yeah, he should chew better, though, but I digress. <laughs> so... He, now we're in a left-hand turn, and I just went back to my original procedure and just start beating the crap out of this dude. So he'll just leave it He's alone. He's like, why? Why are you doing this? Not the time to talk about I'm it, right? cave no. the inside of your head. So he goes he's, – he's out again, or yeah, he just yeah. – he relaxes. It's like, hey, buddy, take it easy. So he's – and so in the position he's in relaxing, imagine being suspended from a harness and he's just got all arms and legs limp, head just down, limp yeah. and his toes are like the lowest point. So I eventually realize we're not going to make where we're supposed to be. I'm going to be by myself. So let's find a suitable place to land. And I look and I find basically a dry riverbed. Uh, but you can see there's boulders and rocks and all sorts of stuff. On your GPS? No. Oh, I'm I sorry. have no through idea. My vision? Through my night I'm just visually looking down yeah. at a freaking mountain range. That the Himalaya, you know, the mean of the Everest is in the Himalayan range is the southern end of it. And you're like, that's an inviting area. It is. That's super inviting. And it's like I picked out an area where it looked like a dry riverbed. And, you know, when you land a canopy, you want to land it into the wind because it slows your forward speed and it mm -hmm. makes the landing much easier. By this point, I was very upset, uh, not only at what the situation, but the individual who was attached to me. So I went the opposite route. I essentially set up to go downwind so we would have more speed to punish him more. Yes. To punish him. And then, so I <laughs> brought it, it wasn't in. Cold enough so I brought it in to get ready to land. And mind you, he's sitting there. I think he was awake at this point because he was moving around, but his toes are just dangling. And now I can see the ground coming. He yeah. cannot. So, about 100 feet off the ground, I just let go of the steering toggles. And I went into the pose that I go with when I do like calendar shoots, you know, on a bare skin rug where you have like your hands yeah. under sure. your chin and your feet and legs are I've up. I've seen together. you in that position and it's hot. So he contacted the ground with his toes, and I surfed him out gonna, doing that, pushing on the back of his head for probably 100 feet. You and, used him as like yeah. a surfboard. I didn't touch the ground until we came to a complete stop. <laughs> He's all, this is yeah. great. Yeah. 
So sure we surf it in. He deserved I, it because, you know, he was there. <laughs> we surf it in. I unhooked from the tandem, grabbed my weapon, <laughs> went to a high ground. I'm like, just stay here. Mind you, the most heavily landmine country on the face of the planet. Jesus Go to some Christ. high ground, get the radio, get in contact with an aircraft. <laughs> they push an aircraft over. We're nowhere near where we're supposed to be. So then I go back and I know, now I'll go check and make sure my guy's okay, right? Because his safety is my main priority this entire time. <laughs> and uh, we go back and and so I see his altimeter is completely shattered from you know most. <laughs> well, you of the, rode him. You rode him for a hundred feet. You rode him like a you hey, rode you know a human surfboard. surfboard. Yeah. He, you know he was what? your wakeboard. I wish it was one hundred and fifty. He was so, your wingsuit. <laughs> but just, the, at least at least the riverbed didn't have any rocks and it's a really and it wasn't cold as the shit. The small ones from altitude were about the size of Volkswagens. So it's amazing yeah. how things get bigger as you get closer. <laughs> can, can I get a can I get a reading on the temperature? On the ground, it was okay. Okay. It was we'll shut up about the 40s and 50s. So we pack up all of our stuff, and in doing so, I got to look at his oxygen mask, which was cracked because of his, I don't know, he sure. must have hit it on something. Mm-hmm. But uh, in there, he basically had, he, I had him wearing it the whole time. I didn't, because I didn't realize he was throwing up. So he basically was skip breathing on his own vomit, throwing up on me, and it was just like eggs, stew, put all of that in a bag. Picked it up and we just walked the rest of the night until we could link and up. And he was able to walk. Yeah, until we were able he was to. Link. That's a tough. Right. By the way, he was fine. That's yeah. a tough motherfucker. Because if I if I told that story as him, the story would go. I uh, they told me I could make a lot of money and uh, just uh, doing translation. I got to fly on a plane. I never flown on a plane before. It was really cool. And said it was going to be a pleasant flight. So I showed up and I had a couple layers on. And then uh, next thing I know, they they strapped me to this dude who was really mean to me. And he had all this gear on. He was he didn't speak any English. But he was kind of a thick guy, and I got strapped to him. And then I had to put a bunch of stuff on my belly. And I was like, what? Jumping out of, huh? And these guys were jumping out of a plane. I'd never been in a plane. So I started to throw up because I was terrified. And then I kept throwing up. And then I lost consciousness, and I was breathing my own vomit. And then he was hitting me in the fucking head. <laughs> yeah, but, really hard. But, to the, but the, if, if Andy doesn't do that, yeah, Andy's dead. Yeah. I understand. I'm just saying for him. But also that, hey, and also, night. it wasn't by choice. It was no, by necessity. That's a rough yeah, night. For, yeah. well, uh, for but both he of knew, us. Uh, to some he knew we were jumping he, out of a plane. That's into. hilarious, yeah. man. That, but then you're story. risking everyone's life. Yeah, so that was the worst jumping experience of my life. <laughs> that sounds and you guys terrible. And you guys hoofed it. Yeah, until we linked up with an army. Hoping you don't step on a landmine. Well, I did tell him to walk 50 feet in front of me. You used him as a guinea pig? 100%. Is, uh, as good would I. God, man. As would I. What a fucking nightmare. What a he, nightmare. So he claimed insanity two days later and quit and never saw him again. I was going to say, he, he damn right he quit. We got back to the base, linked up with the guys. He did a full forward face high lift track into a, a cot, slept for like 36 hours, and then quit when he woke up. You're fucking right. Terrifying. Yeah, that's, that's a, I threw away all my clothes. Like it was, I didn't God. realize, I mean, a, a lot of the pieces of the story, like the vomit thing, I was like, Oh, that's why my clothes absolutely stink. Like, Jesus it, yeah, Christ. it was. I mean, it was terrifying. One of the worst experiences of my life. So I've had some of the best jumping. Yeah, and then that happens. Yeah, God. Yeah, no, that's I'm, that's it. I so was, what do you think? Do we want to do a tandem was, on I Thursday? Like Brian's gonna freak <laughs> out too. I was fucking yeah, because it'll be in San Diego. I was riveted to that. That was oh. God. What a fucking. It sounds so surreal. That kind of a story. And and also like I was thinking about how much how detail oriented you have to be to be like a seal. Like or just all the shit. It's all in the better. details. Yeah, and also technology savvy nowadays. Well, and the risk is to rely on the tech. That's it. I mean, what if you're? I mean, because it, it, it's uncanny how tech will not respond for you when it wanted to. Just like the GPS factory you resetting. To, you have to I had never the, seen that happening. Yeah, but I had a compass, but I just I wasn't prepared to use it, and I'm like, oh, I'll just celestially navigate. I mean, I had never tried to celestially navigate on nods, which is impossible. I mean, it's all. Right. And, you know, so people coming into the military now, they rely on GPS. Yeah. I still, and I, I mean, I teach my kids, this is how you navigate on a topographical map using landlines and features. You don't need a compass. You know, this is wh- how you can tell direction. Like, this is what this mountain looks like on a map. And you have to maintain those baseline skills. Yeah. Otherwise, your actual, the breadth and depth of what you're able to do is super thin. And you're relying on, you know, double A batteries, which is not a good idea. Scary. No. That's so and there's scary. only so many you can take with you. I get to piss so bad. Yeah. <laughs> I had to, I, that story, <laughs> I was going to piss my pants. That, I had to pee when he started it. I, I'm good now. But I was like, I got to hear this. Yeah, that was great. I know. Let's go pee and then we'll come back. Perfect. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, let's get around. Anyway, we're back from a pee break, ladies and gentlemen, with Andy Stumpf. 
Um, so I got. That. That's my top story. Thanks for that. Dude, that was a legit ass That's story. That's best legit. and worst experience ever. Hey, so Riley, we have that guy on the show next week. Perfect. <laughs> I'll be here yes. five minutes before you go live. <laughs> and he's pissed. <laughs> at and he's pissed. And he has some. He has his side of the story. He's got a huge road here. rash on his uh, face still. Can you imagine his side of the story? Holy cow! That's what I'm saying. That would be actually be pretty interesting to sit well, down and be like, so, sir, <clears throat> from your eyes, what it, was it? Probably like? not. Just pure <laughs> chaos. It was dark. I was throwing up. I was inhaling throat. Next thing I know, and I get elbowed seal, in the back of the seal head. Seal Team 6 guy kept hitting me in the head every time I'd come to and knocking me out. So then I tried to get out of there because I was hallucinating. I tried to climb this rope that I saw in front of me, and then I really got a beating. I asked him why he did that actually on the ground, and he said that he was afraid that the harness was going to fail. So he literally was trying to climb up in a in a sense of self-preservation. Oh, that's a yeah. legit point. Well, you know, we all we don't know how we're going to react until we're there. You were a guy who had 3500 plus jumps. Not then. I probably had 500 jumps at that point. Okay. Well, either way, my friend. <laughs> 500, 500 more than him. Fuck off. Okay, that's yeah. 500 times. He had he never been in a fucking plane. Yeah. So he's allowed to have a little bit of a moment. On top of well, no, no, no. There, there's a difference between a little bit of a moment and then shitting the bed and yeah. almost killing Andy. Not in his not in his skill set. He's just a simple interpreter. I should be he was well then. outside of his comfort zone, and yeah. I was at the absolute limit of what I was. I mean, I was at my limit of being able to control myself emotionally and physically. There was so much stuff. Can you tell going us, on. like, how for us civilians, like, if we're in a really dangerous situation, how do they teach you guys to stay calm? Like, if it's really a bad situation. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I would say, uh, you know, I talked. Uh, so I do about half of the year uh, jumping, you know, off of stuff and out of airplanes. By the other half of the year, I do public speaking, and a lot of it is about leadership stuff. And you know, one of the key points when it comes to being a leader is being able to control your emotions because they're infectious. And if you ever worked for a team, and you're working for somebody who you have a lot of respect for, and you see them starting to lose the bubble, yeah. you can sit back and watch what it does to everybody else. It's it's the rising tide theory, mm. right? So when your boss starts losing it, and you're like, "Whoa, what's going on?" Like this guy's. He's dialed in. He's got experience. He's losing his mind. Maybe I'm not seeing something that I should, so I'm going to lose my mind a little bit. Mm -hmm. So emotions are really infectious, and being able to control your emotions is probably one of the most powerful characteristics of a leader, especially if you're in an environment where things are going terribly wrong and you hear your boss come over the radio, and he's in the same firefight as you are or trying to work out a complex problem in the same environment that you are, but he sounds like he's having Mai Tais on the beach. It just immediately ramps you back down a few mm -hmm. gears. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it has to be taught. And it starts with understanding that emotions don't impact outcome in any positive aspect. But they have right. a huge negative downside. I mean, it really doesn't matter how much you want something to happen or how scared you are or how excited you are or how enthusiastic. That does not affect outcome unless you let it affect your judgment. So there's nothing positive that it can do. And even uh, like say you hit target after target after target after target and you develop this sense of – Security, a false sense of security. Everything's been going your way. Even that emotion can be very dangerous on the negative side. Because it's house. superstitious, right? Weren't you talking about that? Like, it's not superstitious. <clears throat> it just, it's an emotion that's allowing you to think that things are always going to go in your way, and mm. it doesn't. So when you start getting frustrated and it impacts your ability to make decisions, your performance goes down. When you start getting too excited and it impacts your ability to make decisions, or you make a decision based off that false sense of security. Bad things can really happen. So it's it's it has a huge consequence, and it's just something that is reinforced from day one. Like you have to maintain control of your emotions. And if you're going to be in a leadership position, and we expect all SEALs from day one, both officer and enlisted, to exude leadership. And I mean the, the classic line is, is, in the absence of leadership, you need to step up and take charge. You have mm -hmm. to. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. You step up yourself. And in training – the training that we do is extremely difficult and we take it to failure all the time. Like we'll, mm -hmm. we'll create a problem that is not fixable and we'll let people start to freak out and you stop the training evolution. And you're like, listen, you see how things are going bad here? This is why it's going bad. And you highlight those failures so they can learn from them in a training environment mm -hmm. as opposed to never addressing them. And then you end up in a real world situation and it's catastrophic. Because most of us are afforded that luxury, right? So what I notice is that most people who go through life <clears throat> say things like this. They go – um, you know, if it's meant to be, you know, uh, it's going to happen. Or, for example, um, th a lot of times they – like people are very superstitious about things. Like they're like – first, most people think it can't happen to me. We all do that, right? So most people think I've got a, I've got a little angel watching over me. In You're talking about like people. bad things? I'm just talking about – yeah, you see that a lot. People are sort of 
uh, irrationally optimistic about uh, certain things. Like just, I was just reading this thing about, I was going to do this, I'm driving my Texting, and you know this, texting has become, and not just that social media in your car, people are dying at an alarming fucking rate. I told rate. you it took over drunk driving, everything. I mean, it's crazy. I it's, dropped it's that a, knowledge. Yeah. It's, it's texting a, it's and a, driving a, did? Yeah it's, yeah. it's it's a worse problem than drinking and driving, weed and driving, anything. And they're trying to come up with this, this, this uh, computer program that allows the police to see if you were swiping or texting as that. opposed to voice to text. I saw that article. And you know, it's, it's the American Civil Liberties Union you know, is like, it's a little bit of an overreach, but I can understand it, man, because it's, if, it's, if they're going to prove that it's as bad as drinking and driving, then you've got to have proof of that. And it'll, 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 and the next time I'm texting and I find, and I know that I could, they can find that out and I'll be liable for murder, I'm not going to text. So in a way, I'm kind of for that law. But the point I'm making is that with you guys, I guess you become such a fucking realist with everything. Even though you've had, say, t- 100 missions that went your way, we all go, you know, you get comfortable. And yeah. you, you, the human beings will get comfortable and more, you know, kind of relax and routine, which can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. And then people careful. die and, and you then, learn not to do that. I mean, right. you go. So we, like I said, we spend all this time planning and briefing before we actually go out. And we have really good intelligence. And you learn not to put too much weight into any of that. That's all the prep work. So you have all the contingencies planned out, like the what ifs, because those are really what makes the bread and butter. If this happens, what are we going to do? And having those things figured out before they happen. But I have planned hundreds of combat operations and take a guess as to how many of them went down as planned. Zero. 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 So you learn that the plan is so you put in the requisite amount of thought. The intelligence can give you a picture but you have to accept the world as it presents itself to you. You can't force your plan on the world. But I'm, I'm sure even with the training and you guys getting put in these high-pressure situations and in those situations, some guys pass that test. But when it comes down to the real and there's real bullets flying, I'm sure even at that level, there's some guys who don't respond like you thought they would. Every team has the lowest performing 10%. Even the teams that win the Super Bowl, even the highest, most elite levels inside of the military. Team human being has... You know, the lowest 10%. Yep. I think usually they go by, by that? vegans. Well, I don't but understand that. What does that mean, 10%? Meaning there's – even in a super high-performing team, right, there's always the lowest performers. There's someone's the there's worst. There's somebody who's the best, the- and there's always somebody who's going to be the worst. So, yeah, ex- the, the selection process to become a SEAL is really good. But – and I have to – and I constantly reinforce this when I talk to people when they ask questions about SEALs because I call it the unicorn theory. They think that – the SEAL teams or the SEAL community exists in like this beautiful pasture with rainbows and unicorns running around. And it's like perfection. It's like it's a cross section of society. We have all of the same problems that yeah. everybody else has. It terminates in a human being. So you're going to have the same human being problems. And even this really highly refined and selected team that has gone through a crazy amount of work to get to where they are, no process is perfect. So, yes, sometimes people who re- respond in ways that we don't expect, yep. they make it through. It's just proof that there's weeds in every lawn, yeah. regardless of the size. That's yeah. all it is. Is there is there like the best? Because Tim Kennedy posted something on Instagram I thought was interesting one time. He said, "I I am not nearly as good an operator as some of the men I served with because I probably shot guys I shouldn't have, and mm-hmm. I sh- I didn't shoot guys I should have. And the best operators were the guys that were able to make those decisions and be able to see the difference and kind of know w- what is the delineation between the the the, the the best operators and the guys who are on the lower 10 percent can you can you define that or maybe not maybe it's really hard to sort of I, uh technical proficiency is definitely i mean it's like basketball right like if you're going to be a pro basketball player you need to have some level of technical fundamental yeah. some people i think have a little bit maybe more intuition or a faster processing speed and they can uptake information a little bit faster, which therefore lets them make decisions a little like bit faster. Like a quarterback, like a good quarterback versus like a yeah. you read the whole backfield. Uh, an even-tempered personality so they're not experiencing a large sine wave of up and down, which all human beings do regardless of what your occupation is. Uh, but maybe one that has lower peaks and valleys would make it better. And I think it's a combination of all of those things. Mm. There are some seals that are not great shots, but – They'd be the last person you would ever want to leave behind because they're so good at everything else. Well, that's why it's a team, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And it's and that's again like there's the highest performers in that team, and then there's the lowest, the lowest. You know, it's it. Yeah, I mean, it's probably subjective as to what makes the best operator, uh, but like the, the combination of those things. Yeah. Let's go to some current events. Fascinating, fascinating shit, man. I love it. What do you got, Jen? I'll show you. 
The first one is actually a police officer in Ohio who says – That's well, not the police officer. <laughs> That's him on the up, right. <laughs> he pulled over oh. these two guys. He found out that there was uh, bags of powder on the ground. And then when he went back to the station, he had some of the powder on his shirt and he brushed it off. And he actually overdosed from fentanyl. And he he died? breathed it in? He didn't die. He just he got overdosed? hospitalized. Skin yeah. contact. Damn. Well, you guys – since you guys were like – I mean I don't know what word to use other than late – so while you guys were late, we were watching the video. So I have a little bit more backstory on this one. It was Let's on his it. shirt. So he said – his buddy said, hey, you got some stuff on your shirt. He untucked his shirt, said he made contact with his finger, index finger and thumb, and then basically f- had an overdose on fentanyl. And there were oh some pictures of the car. God. There was white powder inside of the what car. What is fentanyl? It's a opiate or it's a, it's a pain suppression medication, I think. And I'm sure somebody will crush me. It's like five, ten times stronger than heroin. I think it's it's like 100x more powerful than morphine. Jesus. Damn. Yeah. That sounds like a good. Hey, wait a minute. Not a good time. By the way. uh, They're awesome. They used to give us fentanyl lollipops. And when you give them to people, you tape them to their hand (laughs) because they'll suck on it and like (laughs) pass out. And then they wake up and it's still there. That guy, your tandem jumper. Oh, my God. We, um, you know, very just side note. One time, Andy called me because about details. You're so detail oriented. And when, when, remember when Eddie Bravo and. Oh, God. And Joe Rogan, I think you were there uh, talking about uh, the Kennedy assassination yeah. and the head. The head. Yeah. I was uh, so upset. And I was Rogan, so upset Rogan's at that conversation. About shooting. Yeah. And I, Andy's, you know, it's alleged that as a SEAL, maybe he knows a little something He's about some headshots. Head shots. Maybe not you know, not about, about that. Just an understanding of kinetic ballistics. energy and, and how energy is transferred sure. from a Andy rifle calls to me and he goes, hey, tell Rogan and, and, and Eddie Brown, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about when it comes to <laughs> ballistics. Hey, but Andy, and, you know what the thing is? No one in that room does. That's why it's fun. Yeah, that's like right. no one yeah. does. Yeah, Brian doesn't although, know shit although about Rogan, it. Although Rogan, Rogan's read, Rogan said he read a lot about it, knows a lot about it, and you were like, "Well, not I, about." It's just, it's like you know what? Like, don't be careful with when you're like, if you want to, like, do you have an opinion about that? When you saw his head, I mean, does that look? I would normal? need to. Look, I mean, I would. Lean, I would need to look at the the angles that the tape are shot from. But I mean, just an understanding of kinetics. When you shoot a bullet, it's, it's got a small weight, but it carries a velocity and kinetic energy to it. More often than not, the body, especially if you're going to hit an extremity, is going to fly away from the direction that you take a shot. Sometimes people do fall forward, but it's usually from a severing of the spinal column. Other than that, they're going to fall away. That kinetic energy passes through them. So, um, so yeah. So you, if you get you shoot me in the chest, I'm going to fall backwards, obviously. Uh, unless you lose control of your lower body, like a severing of the spinal column. In that case, depending on where the hinge point is, the angle might bend you over. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> There's little Makes details. Yes. I'll be stealing that and I'll be talking about that yeah. the next the time. The Kennedy one is tough, right? From the Occam's razor perspective, yeah. yes, it's easier to look at a single assassin, but like, like I don't know. You got to look at all the different. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot there. That, that, I was just like, God, it was. I like that you used Occam's razor as a, uh, yeah, as an analogy. Reference. Thank you for your education. Um, so, but what, so this, but he's all right, huh? He just OD'd on he's all right. fentanyl. But, me and uh, Andy saw the video of him talking, and he seemed like he was just sort of telling the story, kind of like hesitant, like it wasn't really the truth. And I'm thinking, is there a possibility that he might have just like, like, tried to really, take the fentanyl? I don't know if it in it's digesting fishy. your fingers that fast. I don't know it either. And then when they showed a picture of the car, he said that they saw people. And again, I have no idea. I'm just looking at a picture. There's only like a 99.5% chance that I'm right. Like we'll leave it out there that I could be wrong. But so if people without gloves are turning pills into dust and it's getting all over the car, why didn't they have a reaction? Why didn't they OD? That that yeah. was my – and it maybe, I, maybe they did. Maybe he rubbed his eyes or – I don't know. But I'm, it's just, maybe he snorted, snorted it. Snorted it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they those don't look guys too look good, but like they don't look like they, 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 don't look like they paid much attention in high school. <laughs> that poor guy. His, his eyes are going – Two different direction. The one on the right. You talking about crazy eyes yeah, on the right? Or you talking, talking about, about tattooed eyes, on the, eyes right. on the left? And tattoos eyes on the on the. Yeah, that's just not a good choice. I don't think a lot of good choices going on with both those guys. Those are not the guys you want strapped on your body when you do a tandem jump. Was that guy on the right? The guy strapped to your in, body in, by chance? There's similarities. There's similarities. <laughs> there are similarities. Yeah, that'd be an issue. What else you got, Jen? <laughs> don't throw don't throw up fennel on my um, on. on I'm gonna have to high. check with my sister. She's a nurse practitioner and like. I mean, I was surprised to hear that you could get a contact. Trans- I don't think so, man. I mean, I know with morphine, like it's got to be intermuscular, intravenous. So and there's Oxycontin, all that. That's what I'm mean, saying. Opiates like, aren't. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. He might have been trying to. It may have may gotten have. in. He may have. 
Got I might have like fell over mouth. and did a couple lines of I'm it. I'm giving the benefit of the doubt to the cop. You guys are assholes. <laughs> hey, hey, man, you're the one. You're the what one. What else you got, Jim? <laughs> All right, this it. one. This girl, she stabbed her boyfriend in a drug alcohol filled rage. She's so hot. Hmm. She's pretty hot. And she's, she's supposed to be like a, a prodigy. From Oxford University, she's going into heart surgery. Damn. Aspiring and surgeon. Aspiring surgeon. And the, the judge that was handling her case says that he doesn't want to give her jail time because she has such extraordinary talents that oh, it'll might, it might ruin her. Well, life doesn't life, work that career. way. Hey, you I know what, though? Agree. I want her saving lives. And you know that they say that sociopaths uh, are drawn oh, well, to... How do you know uh, she's going to save lives? Uh, yeah. listen, you know, you know the crystal ball that says she's actually maybe she could be the worst surgeon ever I Sir, agree maybe she's killing people and she's not that good of a surgeon listen guys how was the knife wound was it guys, clean and precise first of oh. all I want her we're operating on my heart because she just stole my heart Hey, she, Chin, so she, she, got, she got drunk and did like a bunch of drugs and stabbed her boyfriend. Drunks, uh, she got drunk. She did uh, drugs, some kind of drugs that were not listed. And then she punched the boyfriend in the face and threw a laptop on him mm. and then stabbed him with a, a bread knife in his leg. Oh, that's not, not right. bad. Oh, by the way, excuse You're me. You're talking about typical Thursday night at the yeah. shop. A couple also. things about surgeons. Uh, I've actually uh, had some intimate relations with a couple of surgeons. Uh, and I when I say like that, I mean fucking. And, yeah, a and, couple. <laughs> hey, a couple surgeons. I swear to God, or one. Nope, I swear to God, two. And the reason too is because a friend of mine dated a surgeon, and I I got to know all you hung his, out in the clique. Yes, his whole clique. And let me tell you something about surgeons. Number one, the freaks. Type A personalities, freaks. We going anal. They see it all, freaks, bro. We going anal. And also, they say that among the uh, professions that sociopaths are drawn to. One of which, one is chefs, but one is surgeons, because uh, you get to play God. Because you are, you don't have a boss. You're the guy who's running the fucking show. You're, they're they're very effective. You know, you got to be very, you know. Dude, meticulous. look at this dime piece. That's a crazy picture, right? Set of tits on her. She <laughs> looks super sweet too. What is she doing? Well, she's got gloves on. So to what get the, the fennel? Fuck she... To get the fennel. <laughs> no, fennel. First of all, she's she, got a, It looks like, like she's cleaning a gloves. boat, <laughs> she but like she's a, in a ankle deep scene. water. She looks like so the boat's obviously. Like that water's dirty too. That water looks fucking like that guy's throw up. That water is horrifying, and she looks like she's cleaning a boat. Either way, she's cleaning up a crime scene. Or Peep some this shit. though: Woodward is considered a prodigy among prodigies at the prestigious institution. Wow, she's currently believed to be on holiday in Barbados. You're fucking right, she is. Dude, I'm impressed. And by the way, it's a bread knife to the fucking leg. This guy probably cheated on her. Fuck that guy. I like her. Uh, I'd have to see the guy before. Her ambition has been to cure heart disease. She's got her, she, her heart's in the right place. Uh, um, and uh, she's at Oxford. Uh, that means I think she's a Rhodes Scholar. Is that what it means? I don't know. She's a prodigy that stabs dudes. Man, is I'm that impressed. it, Jen? I'm impressed with her. She's 25, and I'm 50. <laughs> uh, my heart hurts. You're out of your mind. Out of your mind. <laughs> she's batshit crazy. Whatever. What can't else you got, Chin? I can't wait to tan him. I'm not mad at right, her, though. Here. If you guys want to see a video of two guys that snuck in and mm, climbed the Golden this. Gate Bridge. Yes, 100% support this. But, I mean, obviously, it's junior varsity because they didn't jump off the top. If you're going to take the effort, take the express yeah, this train. This is some JV oh, shit, it's JV am I right? Shit. I don't know, bros. No, this hey, is amateur You know how long hour. it takes to climb down? Um, Forever. A lot longer than jumping. Yes. I guess. Ooh. So they would hang off the edges, too. And mind you, there's traffic below. This is boys. Mm, yeah. This about is different... not boys. No, no, no. Uh, I, I was risk. a boy. I never did boys this bullshit. Risks, boy. No, these are grown men, I feel I like. No, they're actually little kids. They're, they're like teenagers. teenagers yeah. yeah. Of course. This is guys. Oh, well. Andy, do you laugh at this? <sighs> it's such a good exit point. Take like a nice 10 second delay on that thing. You know, bang. it's also one of the number one uh, areas suicide. for suicide. Yeah. I feel like it's a bad way to go. Coronado I, Bridge, right? Where I live in San Diego is like the number three. You really? just jump and then you hit that water. And- yeah. Well, that's a surface tension to concrete. I mean, beyond, I think, like 100 feet, it's the same. Yeah, they say that the way people have survived, like, Stop one guy it. fell Don't, don't he, you he, dare he, say he makes a knife cutting edge with no, his hand. No, he <laughs> threw a tool, I guess, and it broke the surface tension. He fell, and I heard that. that you yeah. know who I heard that from? Don't even remember. Just somebody said it once, and now I'm taking it. Keep watching movies, Kelly. Yeah, it does. It has a surface tension to concrete, <laughs> so that's why you fucking get... Correct. Some people have survived, but... Look at these guys. I mean, well, if you jump off Golden Gate Bridge and you survive, it's just like God's like, oh, man. It's a freak, it's it's a freak a accident if you anybody. survive, for sure. Yeah. And your life's just way worse. Yeah. Well, you're or they gonna... go complete opposite, like, God, it's yeah. not my time, and they're full body cast. Yeah. But imagine, though, you jump off of that, land in the water, break your neck, and drown. That would be a 
I would assume a bad way to go. Having never tried it myself, I'm going to make yeah. the assumption it would be a poor. Or way. there's a lot of L great white. I was say. So you jump off, yeah. little blood. Oh, I, the water broke mm. my arm. Ah, open water, blood. Yeah. Great white goes. What the Chompy, fuck is chomp, this? Chomp. And the tide underneath that bridge is no joke. You it's get no some joke. huge tidal swings in there. Yeah, you do, and it's cold as fuck. Yeah, that's why people do it because it's like almost 100. percent You. The moral of the story is if you're going to climb the Golden Gate Bridge, take a parachute off. and jump off. Yes, that's it. How, you haven't. Golden Gate Bridge? No, it's illegal. That would be right? illegal. That would be. Yeah. We should, probably shouldn't talk about. It. All right. <laughs> so, what do you guys think of this? It's causing an uproar because they're saying that the security equipment is supposed to be a multi-million-dollar equipment, and it's like approved by the Homeland Security. And two teenagers. And the two teenagers there. were there for ten minutes. They didn't get caught on motion detectors, cameras, nothing. Yeah, it doesn't surprise mm-hmm. me. Teenagers figure out figure their teenagers? way. Teenagers? Well, you're well. Someone who wants to do damage to the that's Golden why, Gate Bridge is that's going. That's why it's causing an uproar. Excellent. That's a tough one. At the end of the day, though, you can't stop motivated people, regardless of the measures that you have. I mean, Especially there's always if they're willing to risk my life. Yeah, you're always going to be able to find a seam. That's right. Well, you, you, I agree with that. But when two teenagers who are a, a high on weed can climb and get in there, it's kind of we. I mean, you can take some better precautionary kind of measures. Hook it like up have to guards like a, just around like human, or guards. just make it so it's not or that easy to hook get up. Those there. little things are holding on to up to car batteries. You know, it's like that's see electric bridge would make way more. I'm sense. not saying it's humane. I'm saying people probably wouldn't touch they it. They wouldn't I touch agree. it if it's electric. It makes more sense. <laughs> hey, I touched a one time. I touched with my my middle finger. I brushed a an electric fence to keep bulls out, dude. It I went shocking. like that. Shocked me. You're lucky you it didn't touch it with an so open hand. It hurt so fucking bad. It hurt. Really? It was like Dah! like like I, I don't even know how to describe it. I mean, you ever done that? You ever been electrocuted? No, but like if you would have touched that with your open hand, it would have cinched your hand around it. Oh my god, you can't get off. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's why when you test electricity, you use the back of your hand. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Probably like this. Well, god. Cal- <laughs> is this electricity? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. What use the back of your hand. See that? That's my dropping knowledge, you fucks. <laughs> All right, so Giselle Bunchen, she was on a CBS morning show, and she mentioned that. Tom Brady was having multiple concussions, oh, and then he this. had one like last year as well. And I, I guess you shouldn't have said that because he wasn't on the list of concussions. No. You have to be on a list, right? And you yeah. can't play a game if you're if you have a concussion. Yep, it's their so, like concussion protocol. Is she safety. diagnosed? And now, or is a doctor? And now they're looking into whether or not he lied, or if the, if the NFL is covering it up. Well, who said that he had a concussion? His wife. His wife on on. She CBS says she'll, co- he'll come home with concussions, or maybe Tom goes tells her I have a concussion. Do you believe that? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. From his. Oh, the, hits. the thing is with concussions in football, it, you know, it's it's kind of what you sign up for. So when Tom yeah. Brady comes home and goes, "Yeah, babe, I got a concussion." You play quarterback. You're starting quarterback for New England Patriots. Everyone's trying to rip your head off. So uh, there's going to be so many more concussions undiagnosed and not brought to light. It's just part of the game. And also now, if he came out to have a concussion, now you're missing games. These yeah. guys don't want to miss games. No. So it's like part of the deal. But also, how do they diagnose? But also, though? Giselle, can you just say, "Hey, I have a concussion," or is there? A- There's symptoms. I mean, you've had. Con- I have, pressure, yeah, but man. I never went. I mean, you just have a headache. Well, the headache, throwing up, uh, sensitive to light. You know, there's a number of things. There's also, um, I remember in college, there was a, you, before the season started, you do this reaction thing, kind of like these puzzles. Uh, processing speed tests. Processing test. speed tests. So they do that and you might score 50. And let's say you have a concussion. They say, take the test and you score 20. They're like, yeah, you can't Jesus play. Christ. That'll That's be crazy. interesting. Yeah. I but, agree with you, though. It's kind of like, hey. But of course he you, does. You get the ball every play and people want to take it from you. You're Tom Brady. Yeah. You're a yeah. model that wears Uggs that throws footballs the best out of it. You're also, you're also in industry. Like we watch. I'm not. He, but he's not complaining. Yeah. You know, Tom Brady's not the victim. No, he wants man. to play. That dude yeah, he's like, like he's of course. Yeah, yeah, he's good. But also Giselle, shut your mouth. Make those golden babies. Yeah. Like why would she went on this interview and, you know, now it's an issue for Tom Brady. Yeah. But how It's going to be so easy for Tom to be like, which, no. I, I would said I had a headache. I, had a headache, and I, had a headache I just didn't want to have sex. And I had a headache. Yeah, he's just. I didn't want to fucking. You know, of course he never it's gonna be that. easy to get out of that. Yeah, I'm sure he says that. I bet There's you, someone tired of fucking. Brother, you're so right about there. that. Yes. You are so right about that. I don't care how hot she is. Her husband's like, eh, tonight, <laughs> fuck it. It's always there. Yeah. I want something strange. What else you got, Jen? <clears throat> All right, this is a good one. This kid over here, when he was born, he had like. The mother was having birth issues, and he got 
he was choking during the birth. So he ended up having cerebral palsy. His name is Ding Ding. His name is Ding Ding. He's 29 years old now. His mother didn't give up on him. His doctors, <laughs> his doctors told his doctors told his mother he's not worth saving. He's gonna have too low of intelligence, and he ended up going to Harvard. That's That's went movie. to Harvard. That's a Harvard. movie. Let's change his name. Harvard the movie. Law School. Ding Ding doesn't no, work. You leave Ding Ding. Don't, don't, don't change it to Dong Dong or Ding Dong. No, he got accepted to Harvard. He went to Harvard, so he must be killing it. So his doctors are kind of full of shit there. Yeah. At least the mom stuck with him. Look at him. Looks a little out of little baby. That's a love mother's love, boy. That's a dude. That's so cool. Yeah, uh, yeah, the name Ding Ding she fucked up on. <laughs> yeah. When I think of Ding Ding, I don't know if you ever heard the leaked voicemails of uh, Barry Bonds with his side piece. No. Oh, he's paying the side piece and he got leaked and he would call her and go, <laughs> he has that high voice, go, I know what you need tonight. You need some Ding Ding. And just hang up. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. He'd be like, hey girl, flying into, flying into New York today. I'm gonna stop by, give you that ding ding, and just hang up after you say ding ding. <laughs> my friend, my friend said Barry called, Bonds dropping ding ding. My friend who got divorced and his wife, he called up my when and she played a message. Message. She goes, "This is what I deal with," and all it said he was from uh, Uruguay, and he goes, "Yeah, I just want you to know that I'm gonna come home tonight. I'm gonna fuck the shit out of you. Okay, bye." <laughs> <laughs> I was like romantic. <laughs> Romantic. He goes, yeah, that's that's what I'm married. I'd to. rather have that than ding ding. What are you seven? I'm you some yeah. Ding ding. That, who, who, old I mean, girl's like, ooh, I am turned on. Yeah, you got to do. Did this. he say ding ding? You got to give. You got to make a noise so she doesn't know. Hey girl, I'm 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 gonna give you some. Uh, uh. Hey girl, I'm gonna give you. I don't no, think it makes it better at all. Hey honey, you know those get, make you better, baby. You're gonna get some. <laughs> do you see J.R. Smith when he got caught? That girl blasted his DMs. Some some girl slid in his DMs when he's coming in town to play somewhere, and he just responds. You know, she put like, "Hey, have a good game tonight," and he just resp- replied back, trying to get that pipe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling my wife right now on on air, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna go, "Hey, baby, I'm just looking for some <laughs> tonight. I want to see what she says." Watch this. This is either gonna be really cool or complete shit show right, and ruin the flow. Let's just see what she says. She is. Say you trying to get that pipe. Yeah, you try, okay. Say what's up, bitch. Trying to get that pipe. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Come on, she's not gonna answer. She's answer. doing what my wife would do. Ignore the call. Of course she does. She rolls her <laughs> eyes. She's already rolling her eyes. That bitch. She's bald deep in a horse Hi, right now. I'm not able to get to. Ah, the fuck. God, we gotta do that though. <laughs> gotta do that. Let's see. If she, if she calls, calls you back, back. Say what's up, bitch. Trying to get that pipe, and let's see exactly what happens. That's exactly what I'm gonna do. That's exactly what I'm gonna do. This is awesome though. <laughs> Don't name your kid Ding Ding. And, and also fuck better. doctors in this case. That's so cool. Oh, and her husband, too. Her husband divorced her over this whole thing. Aww. She taught herself how to massage his stiff muscles and would also play educational games with him. What an amazing woman. Wow. Actually, what That's an awesome. amazing woman. Awesome. That's Anything so possible. cool, man. Is that it, Chin? That's pretty much it. It's pretty legit. Uh, I saw events. big cat. That's oh my cool. god, that's oh a giant cat. Oh my god. I fucking hate Four cats. Four foot Australian cat, maybe the world's longest. That's a giant cat. Look uh, at this cat next to a dog. What? <laughs> what? Dude, that thing's a fucking lion. That's a, what is that? That's a Sheltie. The thing is towering over a Sheltie. Sheltie. Yeah. Those that, are small dogs. That's they're a like little, little uh, But it's not that small. They're not huge, though. No, they're definitely not. But I that's a giant fucking cat. Do you? I hate cats. They're kind of magical. <laughs> They're not though. They're kind of bitches. No, cats. They say you, they, they, they also. You know, cat is an animal. They say you could. Let's say you own a cat. I can take your cat from yeah, your house, it de- bring it to mine, and it's like yep. Could give. It two doesn't shits. get domesticated. No, it, ne- it doesn't. So give if a they fuck were about big, its owners, if they were big, anything. they'd just be just like lions. They would kill you. Yeah, they like, don't give a fuck about yeah, you. They don't. Uh, anything I can just put a bowl of food and water and leave for I don't know six months, come back and it's all good. Yeah. It's fucking weird. Cat but people I, freak me out, man. Buddy of mine had the best analogy about cats. He's like, listen, you know, dogs, you feed them every day, you pet them, you play with them, and they look at you and they go, you're amazing. You must be God. Yeah. Cats, you feed them, you try to play with them, you pet them, and they look at you and they go, who is this idiot? Yeah. I must be God. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's true. <laughs> That's cat great. Thinks true, that man. God. That's so great. <laughs> fucking, yeah, cats are weird. You yeah. got to feed them that fancy food and shit. And I'm yeah. also allergic to them. They also suck. If someone brings this cat to my live show in Australia, I'm going to kick in its fat fucking face. You should have talked to uh, Cam about how they hunt cats in Australia. What kind of cats? cats? They hunt cats in Australia. Like these cats? I 
can't say it necessarily. Oh, because they kill cat. all the because uh, they kill the birds. But like in hunting magazines, yeah. I heard Joe talking about it all the time. In hunting magazines, they'll like be holding up a cat, like a regular house cat. Just well, because like... they 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 wreak havoc on a lot of the native birds. How many species? fucking cats? Are so doing many. This? So so cats. So domestic cats. Pull up. Pull this up. Domestic cats kill an insane number of birds in this country every year. You like also know. You also know bird. cats like house cats are. For size, pound for pound, the most sophisticated and efficient killers. There oh my are. God, they are! They kill more birds in this country. It's like an um, unbelievable. Um, you got to see that in Australia. Now, let's see. Let me see what the article says here. There you go. It's no surprise Australia has recently announced a plan of two, two million feral cats by twenty twenty. <laughs> um, and the call isn't part of some cruel anti cat agenda. In Australia, feral cats, which were introduced by the first European settlers, have become a huge threat to native wildlife. They're blamed for the extinction of several species unique to the country, God like damn, many invasive species. Eating them nonstop. Yep. Uh, good at killing the locals, and they thrive and breed. Who kills more cats, Australia or uh, like parts of Asia? Um, <laughs> no, it's not my friend. Because um, Asia kills a lot of cats too, right? I don't Jim? Know. No. Uh, I don't know. I thought I, I, I just know that. Can you look up how many cat, how many birds American cats kill? It's some crazy number, like crazy. It's so fucking. How many birds? Billions, not so fast. Kill cat. Cats kill, kill up to three point seven billion birds annually. Now think USA about how many today. that is. Three point seven billion. I didn't know there was that many goddamn birds. I didn't either. Um, as many as twenty. Billion mammals, including mice and rabbits, are also killed by cats. You see my whole fucking thing against cats now? These assholes. People love cats. You better be careful. Well, anyone who sweet. just has cats, I don't need a My defense. My social studies teacher, I will, the first time I ever saw a grown man cry, my social studies teacher in Saudi Arabia was, uh, and he had been a, a military guy and all that, and he came in and he said, he, he said, um, Guys, um, do me a favor and take it easy on me today. My cat, my cat, my cat, my cat, my cat died. You're joking. He goes, my cat died yesterday. How old were you guys? started to cry. I was in eighth grade, I think. Or Probably don't in, do that to eighth graders because they're going to make fun Dude, of you. Dude, and I was like, everybody got quiet. I was like, that's a grown man crying. I've never seen that. He's crying over a cat, which was so foreign to me. I was like, I didn't have cats. So I was like, and he said he had taught the cat how to sit. Anyway, long story short, he cried. He Over just a cat. broke down right in front of us. I'm going to one-up your story. When I was in eighth grade, I had this social studies teacher came in, and he would always – you could tell he had, like, this fascination with, like, he wanted to be a performer and, like, sing songs. And, you know, any time he'd bring in his guitar and just play a little fucking thing, and he must have been working hard on it. And it was, like, a typical fucking Tuesday morning. And everyone sits down and he goes – I want to play a song for you guys to start today's class. I'm going to play a song for you guys. He goes, I wrote it myself. I worked hard on it. He sits down in front of the class, and everyone's like, what? The? We're in eighth grade, so everyone's an asshole. Everyone's like, what the fuck's going on here? And he gets into this fucking MTV Unplugged in front of eighth graders. <laughs> That's <laughs> embarrassing. And it's a love song. Well, and someone in the well, back goes, awkward. You, someone in the back goes, you suck. <laughs> and I swear, he goes, he just, the sheer... Disappointed by his face, he just goes, all right, all right. <laughs> Takes guitar, puts it behind the desk, and I thought he was going to cry. And everyone's like, what the fuck is going on you here, You suck. Some, some at bully That is back. so mean Because you say. suck. I would never say it that. It was... Terrible. My though. buddy launched into a song. He started singing, and the only thing that saved us, like he, like it was like this, like we're all hanging, like not more than this, this many people, and he just started. Singing a song where his nostrils were flaring. <laughs> he was talking like this. And I'm not kidding. His voice was generic. And so was the song itself. When I first saw you, my heart fluttered. Like that. And, and we're all like this. We're all like, all right, nobody move. Everybody stay very still until this is over. This this too shall pass. Where this too shall pass. It was. I'd rather be in the water with crocodiles. I, I, this too shall pass. I'm, I'm dying. And all of, so sudden, all of a sudden, my buddy, my buddy, he goes. You just see him. And all of a sudden, you hear, you hear. <laughs> <laughs> and he was asleep. He's is out. <laughs> And, and my buddy turns to his credit. He stopped playing the guitar, and we all started laughing. Right? Well, it's probably not a good time to sing right Ugh, now. It is there awkward. is nothing more embarrassing when somebody starts fucking singing. Is that it, Jim? That's it. It's even embarrassing when it you know when it was my girl's birthday and her mom can sing. She was a singer, 
and like everyone's around, you know, happy birthday, and she's all, happy birthday. Oh, oh Jesus. <laughs> The American Idol rendition. There's always, there's always that person in the back. <laughs> happy birthday. Hey, man, Virgin Records isn't here to fucking oh. sign you off this happy birthday. This is my chance to shine. Here. Yeah. Oh, and I'm all shitty. Oh, that's the it's worst. It's actually really beautiful. But If you sing my if everybody sings my wife, I'll make everybody sing my wife a birth, like birthday, happy birthday. She gets so embarrassed. She can't have. Oh, here she is. Say, what's up, bitch? Awesome. Trying to get the pipe. What's up, baby? You looking for that hey. pipe? You looking for that pipe tonight? Am I looking for what? You looking for that pipe tonight? You want me to give you some pipe? Are you talking about your penis? <laughs> Don't call it a penis, man. <laughs> call it my cock. You looking for <laughs> some pipe? Say yes or Why? no. Why? Is this the plumber? Yeah, this is your plumber, bitch. Okay. Yeah, how lucky are you? You get to have my my 50-year-old dick. So lucky. Yeah, baby, that's it. That's it. Where are you at? You with the kids? I'm um, just walking home with Finn. Oh, that's so hot. All right, yeah. I gotta go. You're on what air. What are you doing? I, I just recorded you on the podcast. Enjoy that. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta go. Yeah, that's really She's hot. like, is this? She's walking my son home, and I'm. And I'm oh, yeah, trying to get that pipe. She's trying, all, what, what is this? One of those weird plumber things again? She goes, you trying to go anal again, Brian? <laughs> well, uh, it just backfired. That doesn't happen. You trying to go. That doesn't happen. I pay all the bills, and I still don't get that. God yeah. damn it. That yeah. call would have gone so different with my wife. Your wife would have freaked out. Oh. She's so used to she me. She would have just like, unloaded on me. I'd have been like, I got to go. Uh, never mind. <laughs> Click. See, my wife is so so bored with me. She's already like, she's seen it yeah. all. I mean, I just. You know. She's like, yeah, Brian, are you referring to your penis again? Yeah, like so wife, not I don't have time me. for this shit. Don't call me. Like, oh, sorry. It's yeah, okay. sorry. <laughs> you're getting the pipe later. Click. <laughs> Andy was laughing. You were dying just awkward. awkward. Funny. Super awkward. I was awkward. hoping it would go way uh, worse. Let me give everybody a dropping knowledge really quickly. A young man asked me for advice recently and i started talking to him and i and you guys can weigh in on this and i realized he was asking himself all the wrong questions he was just asking he was he was asking himself defeating questions and like what if i fail what if i'm not good enough and i i i've always used this as a technique change the questions you're asking yourself to be more helpful change your primary question most people have a primary question this is from tony robbins but i can't believe i'm doing this but it helps hey bro most people i know i read it but but i, I don't want, i want to give him credit but it, but it works change the questions you're asking yourself a lot of times people ask self-defeating questions so ask yourself a question that's going to help you like what action do i have to take today to get closer to who i want to be so that's my tony robbins moment but andy hmm. weigh in on that because you guys have to ask yourself some pretty uh, positive questions I'd, I'd imagine when you're in the theater of war when you're doing the shit you do not at your level I'm assuming those guys to get be a Navy SEAL you're you not gotta do asking mental the judo. wrong questions you gotta do mental judo don't you I, I would say 90% of what we do is between the ears um, but you know one thing that we don't shy away from in the teams is failure I mean if anything we pursue failure because if you look at you know and I see this all the time people are afraid of failing and it's it's ridiculous because Everybody's going to fail. All three of us are going to fail. We have failed. You might fail at something today. And it really just depends on what you're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. So the SEAL selection process is looking for people who use it as motivation as opposed to mm -hmm. a stumbling block. That's really all it is. So instead of being afraid to fail, pursue those things that you're scared of failing at and just dive headlong into those things mm -hmm. until there's something else you're afraid of failing at, which is – I mean I agree with what, what you're saying. It's just a kind of different – looking at it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. yep. There you go. Boom. Confirmed by Andy Stumpf. And Tony Robbins. And Tony Robbins. My friend, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks awesome. for Great stuff, man. We loved it. And What's where, can, the they, where can they give? Foundation yeah, let's talk about that for a second. Uh, you know, they're still out there doing their thing. The last few months have actually been, you know, rough. Guy got killed in Somalia. Two other service members injured on that target. Uh, and then guy killed in Yemen in January. Yep. You know, which speaks exactly to what that organization is there to do. And <clears throat> it's... You know, having seen the notification where there's a car full of people who go to a house that's in uniform, there's absolutely no doubt as to what they're doing there. They're not there to have a cup of coffee. And, uh, you know, I didn't realize how hard it is or how hard it was on my family when I was gone. I'm actually of the conclusion now that the easiest job in the dynamic of being in the military or in a military family is actually being the service member because mm -hmm. you're selfishly around the people that you love doing what it is that you want to do. And everybody else is – hoping that nothing happens mm -hmm. and they bear a lot of the burden of what makes the things that we do possible. And then when that person gets notification that their loved one is dead, there's a lot of things that have to happen. I mean, there's the kids, 
financial decisions in a moment where you're totally emotionally compromised. Uh, you know, it, I've seen it where the wife didn't know what to do with the husband's body. Cremate, bury, military funeral. Do you want to bury him in uniform? It's like those are super difficult decisions to make and to have organizations and people that are there generally upon notification to help take that burden off the family. Mm-hmm. It's huge. you know. And I the bet. SEAL Foundation has a breadth and depth of programs, everything from like that first knock stuff to – the cool thing about them is that they'll be there for that first knock, but they stay with the family for as long as the family needs them until they say, hey, we're good. We got it from here. So – educational support for the kids. They do retreats for the survivors. Uh, they do gold star retreats where just the children from, you know, uh, families that have lost a service member, they can come, they have grief support groups. They have, I mean, everything from dental support to medical bills. I mean, it's, it's invisible until you get a knock on your door and it's, it's the thing that you absolutely need. Are they funded properly? They are funded and they're funded 100% by the benevolence of the American people. So it's, so people can give where? They go to the Navy SEAL Foundation? You can go directly to the Navy SEAL Foundation website. And it's, uh, you know, they're very transparent. I think it's 96 cents out of every dollar goes to the causes. Wow. 4% to the overhead. They have the highest rating of any charity. And it's, uh, you know, there's never going to be a time, I think, I mean, I'm totally guessing, but there hasn't been a time since the inception of this country where there hasn't been people who have their toes on the line somewhere mm-hmm. in defense of what we are trying to be. Mm-hmm. And, you know, those people are deserving of the support of the American people when something happens. And that's, you know, that's one of many organizations that you can go to and support financially that will be there when, I mean, just imagine having a knock on the door first thing in the morning, getting ready to take your kids off to school. And there's four people standing out in front of your house in uniform. I mean, that, it's, I can't even describe it. That and, and doing that as a job and taking, yep. you know, that's gotta be, so is it, and it was Navy SEAL Foundation? Navy SEAL Foundation, yep. And that's NSF. easy to find? Yep, yep it's awesome. super easy to find. It's Google Navy SEAL Foundation. And again, if that's not your flavor, give back to a firefighter organization. Give back to a policing organization. I mean, that's all, again, it's spokes on a wheel. Like yep. there's constantly people out there who are invisible 99.9% of your you life until you need them. Yep. Yeah, fuck yeah. That's well, right. Well, thanks for coming on, and, man. And, Great and, stuff, and in the zombie bro. apocalypse, please have your phone on speed dial because I'll be calling you and I'll, we'll be needing you. And we'll be, you guys can work for me for your daily water ration. Right. It'll be and, good. Deal. And, We're going to hang Andy on you like me. that poor guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hanging on oh, yeah. You. yeah. Yeah, we will. Andy gave me a little. I I, I came around the corner with it. my fake gun. And, uh, hey, bro, I, we're trying I, to wrap this thing well, up. I used my head. I guess I looked around first, and uh, that was the wrong thing to do. Don't lead with your eyes, guys. Yeah. All right. Good. Thanks so much. Andy Snow. <laughs> Terrible story. Great stuff. Great story. This is the fighting kid. We're out.